Holy moly. What is today, Sal? Uh, I think it's the final day. It's the final, final. Not again. Yes, again, again, again. (laughs) It's the final day for the Maps Prime bundle, which includes Maps Prime, which is our program designed to help you figure out how to prime your individual body for your workouts. And believe us, it makes a tremendous difference in your progress if you prime properly. That's right. Believe us. It also includes Maps Prime Pro, which is correctional in nature. It comes with seven self-assessment tools. So you can assess things like how your scapula functions, your shoulder blade, uh, your shoulder, your uh, your hips, your ankles, your toes, your wrists, your neck, your lumbar spine. Based on those tests, it helps direct you to correctional movements and exercises that are unique to this program that will get you moving better, alleviating pain, and of course, uh, working out better. Both programs are put together in this bundle and they're discounted tremendously. And today's the final day for this discounted bundle program. You can find this at mindpumpmedia.com. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So uh, something we did a little bit different, this is kind of cool, we were interviewed uh, by a couple guys, very, very cool characters, man. Christopher Kelly and Dr. Tommy Wood uh, are both the CEOs and, and the chief scientific officer for Nourish, Balance, and Thrive. They interviewed Sal and I on Saturday, and it was a really good conversation, and we decided that we would throw this up on the Mind Pump podcast also for you guys, because we went back and forth, even though they were interviewing us. We got a chance to actually dive into their business and some of the things they're working on. And great conversation, man. Excellent conversation. Two very, very intelligent gentlemen who are what we believe to be working on really the cutting edge uh, of analysis for um, performance. Um, I mean, I called it the holy grail uh, of what they're what they're working on is the whole, potentially the holy grail. Really keep an eye out for these guys. They've got an excellent podcast, too, called Nourish, Balance, Thrive. Well, what you see they're doing is it reminds me of like Uber and Netflix and these these businesses in the future that are cutting out the middleman. Nowadays, what happens? You feel your sex drive is down. You don't have energy. You're grouchy, whatever. And you start to notice that for a long period of time. So what do you end up doing? You go see your doctor because you're not sure what's going on, where they have actually been working on this for the last three years of gathering all this data from people and testing blood and urine tests to go with, to correlate with a series of questions to help predict what you may be lacking in. Where yeah, you so, might have so literally, I mean, I call it the, the Holy Grail because it's, like it's a questionnaire that then has been pretty accurately predicted, predicting in terms of where they would want to go next. High 90s. I believe he said like 98. He says it in this episode, so you'll see it. I believe it was 98% or something like that. He talks about it. And we get into a lot of different things. We talk about gut health and the science of exercise. And they interview us about you know why we started the podcast and what went behind the creation of our programs. Had a lot of, uh, a, lot of a great conversation with these two gentlemen. Um, two of my favorite podcast hosts that I've met uh, so far. And the cool thing is they're in our backyard. They're, they're based out of... Santa Cruz. So we're going to be posting in the show notes a link to their seven-minute uh, performance analysis, uh, which is free. Um, and there's going to be also a link to a video that explains how it works in the show notes. So without any further ado, here we are talking to Christopher Kelly and Dr. Tommy Wood. Uh, food quality versus quantity. I want to go straight for the freaking controversial <laughs> shit. I want to start with something like that. Let's. What's more important? Uh, food quality. Why? See, now, now you say <laughs> you say that so so po- so sure, but uh, there are people in the fitness industry who will comp- will say no. The most important thing is calories, and then macros, and then food quality is somewhat important, but it's not nearly as important as the quantity. Just don't overeat. Why? We, why do you say quality? Because it makes doing the quantity bit that much easier. If you start with the fact that the food that we're eating today, so if you do like an Uh, if it fits your macro style uh, approach. The food that you're eating, say you're eating a lot of junk food, processed food, the hormonal effect that that food has is completely, um, it's been completely disconnected from the macronutrient content. So you can process a food and it will have a much greater effect on your physiology um, without changing the macros. So you're 
doing something, you're manipulating the food, you're telling your body that there's something in that food that isn't there. So you have a much higher, say, glucose spike, insulin spike with a completely the same macro content. And so you're telling your body to try and adjust based on that when it doesn't know how to do that. Mm. So the problem that we're, we're seeing is that people are putting their body in a scenario where it doesn't know how to control its calorie intake. And yes, the important thing is to have a net calorie balance. It's impossible, literally impossible to figure out exactly how many calories there are in a piece of food. Like right. you cannot do it. That's, that's such it. a great point because people are like, oh no, I count. I know exactly how many calories I'm eating. And, and Which I tell people this, you go to, let's give an example of a popular place like, like Chipotle, right? So you can go on to Chipotle's website or you can go on to your fat secret, my fitness pal, Chipotle pops right up. They have the serving size, what it is. Anybody who's ever ate there more than once knows that there's always the chick that hooks you up. There's always the guy that doesn't hook you so much up. And the, and how much of a difference. So each one of those, right? First the, first the white rice, then the black beans, then comes this chicken serving. Each one of those easily can be off anywhere from 80 to 300 calories. Each one of those scoops, which can now be a, a net difference of like, a thousand. That's a huge yeah. difference. But even, even if you go back to the actual calculation they did in the first place, yes. so you've, you've taken the food and you have like a standard portion size, right? And you do some chemistry to figure out how much, how many amino acids there are, how much glucose there is, how much fat there is. Then you can set fire to it essentially, and that tells you how many <laughs> calories there are in it, which is just complete nonsense because that's not how the body actually processes mm. anything. But then, uh, so you can do that with, with a food, right? But if you're actually calculating how much energy your body gets out of something, so say, uh, like I said, it's been ground down compared to how it was as a whole food, if it's raw or cooked, compared to what the calorimeter says when you've set fire to that food and it tells you how much energy is in it, that can vary by almost up to 50%. So wow. you're, the, um, the, the error compared to what the back of the packet says versus what your body actually absorbs is so large that when you're stuck just trying to cal calculate calories macros from what's on the back of a packet, it's literally impossible. And this is this is why, because let's be honest here, for the last, I don't know what, four decades, we've been told we've been told this model, eat less, move more. It's all about calories in versus calories out and calories are all that matters. And what's been happening is the opposite in terms of the results that we're getting, people are heavier, uh, people are sicker, and it doesn't seem to work that way. And in fact, when people are told to make general healthy decisions versus just cutting calories on the long term, the ones that make the healthier decisions have longer term success. And there's something else that we don't talk about a lot, and be mainly because we don't understand well enough, and maybe you do because I know you have a background in neurobiology, but the palatability of food, the, the signal of taste even if it doesn't have a calorie attached to it or a macronutrient attached to it, that is another signal that is telling your body different things. And it is a driver in the sense that it does drive behavior. So if you're constantly just counting macros and calories and it's consisting of these super engineered, highly palatable foods that you would never find in nature. And let's be honest, the body... Did not evolve. Wait, 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 wait. There's not a pop tart tree. Yeah, exactly. Mm. The bo the body did not evolve even understanding what these combinations of flavors and it, it, you can do to the body or what the, what they what they mean because your body translates taste uh, from an evolutionary standpoint to nutrients, right? Like sweet means this, and salty means this, and bitter means that, and the combination of these things mean this. It doesn't mean that anymore. We don't even talk about the taste, which may be why. Lots of studies are showing things like calorie-free sweeteners actually have a negative effect on you know weight and uh, and metabolic function, and it may be separate from the fact that it affects things like your gut microbiome. And maybe it's just that you're sending this sweet signal that's not accompanied by mm. you know sugar or other types of things that you normally get from those things. So all of this stuff is very very important to to take into account. And you'll find again working with clients like we have. I've worked with probably thousands of clients and hundreds of trainers who've trained clients. And every time I, you know, we change our, our message to focus on food quality, it seems like the rest of it follows along. Whereas the other way around doesn't always work that way. And there's a simple reason for that. And it's because, so like you say, there's, there's a whole, there's a huge industry and science behind making food hyperpalatable. So you want to eat more of it. So you could 
if you have the patience of a saint, you could manipulate the calories in that food so that you eat less of it. You could do it. It's just super fucking hard because right. that because that food is telling you I want to eat more of it. Right. And so when you when you focus on food quality, like you say, Sal, what happens is your brain is actually finally allowed to regulate its calorie intake. So like say, it's supposed to. Like it's supposed to, exactly. So if you put the body in an environment where it actually which it actually understands, then if you eat five thousand calories one day, you're just less hungry the next day and you eat less food and it all evens out. But you have to put the body in a scenario where it can do that. And when you're under artificial lighting all day, you're inside staring at your computer, you're not moving, you're eating processed food. That is not an environment where you can regulate calorie intake. And so it's just you can do it. You can cut calories if you really want to and do it long term. And so that works for some people, but it's just really hard. Well, so, here's the challenge is, and I and, and I know this is anecdotally speaking, but I know we've also had tons. You guys, too, have worked with lots of people. When you grew up like myself, like I grew up allowed to eat all the sugar, candy, cereals, ice cream, all these things, all these palatable foods that we're talking about. So as an adult... I didn't want fruit and vegetables. They tasted bland as yeah. fuck. I would eat a strawberry, and it, a strawberry doesn't taste like anything to me. I'd eat vegetables, and it would be like, bleh. It just tastes like I'm eating grass. Like, this is awful. <laughs> and I remember I'd, as a trainer, I would start to get these clients, and they would express the same thing back to me. And I'm like, I, inside, I'm trying to, as a trainer, tell them what to do. But I, I also understand. I'm going like, I know I hate that food, too. <laughs> it took me a long time. Before and this is why too I, I I always recommend like an elimination diet to people at first if you've been somebody who's been poorly eating for a very long time and you know that and then to slowly reintroduce foods back it's amazing what happens when you clean your system out you get rid of all that shit and then you actually start to reintroduce things like fruit now after I've done this and I go whoa an apple a strawberry is so powerful and so sweet and tastes amazing then go try and have like a sour patch kid or go and see how how crazy strong that i was just yeah. sharing with you guys at breakfast why i can't eat at this breakfast spot next to me because i bite into it and i could taste the the sugar that they're pouring inside of it and i think wow a lot of people love this because they're but they're used to that so now there's this what's happening with all these foods that are are, are being processed and made is it's a, it's like we keep it's upping competition, it man. it reminds it, me of the pre-workout game right now right when when pre-workouts first entered the market like 10 years ago it was like hey throw a little bit of caffeine in there people are going to feel that well now it's like 300 grams now 400 grams well now, now some nice now, now some of them like, are getting banned because people are dying from taking right some and the food industry is the same thing it's like who can make it sweeter who can make it stronger because we're getting so adapted yeah. to but this there's, new but there's a there's a balance there they have something called the bliss point uh that's that's the technical term and it's basically it's you, if you if it's too sweet or too salty or too much, you'll stop eating it because your t your brain is thinking, okay, I've had enough of this. Right. You get you get flavor fatigue, so they get to a point where they where they have the right mix of salty and sweet and umami, and they, they sort of manipulate it so that your brain never gets tired, and then you eat more and more and more. Oh, and more. That's wow. right. Like, that's right. One of the best ways to do that is to get, send your body your brain different signals of taste. So if you're eating something that's really sweet and you're eating a lot of it. And let's say you're in a food competition and you need to eat more, but you just can't stomach eating more of it. One of the most effective things you can do, and, and professional food eaters will actually do this, is they'll introduce something salty. Have you seen uh, you seen the show? You guys seen the show Man vs. Food? Yeah, so Rob Wolf, did he, he told that story on your podcast, yes. didn't yeah. he? Yeah. And actually, I've done the same thing. So when I did the 100 Nugget Challenge, I had a vanilla milkshake with me because I know that I, got I would get bored of eating chicken nuggets. This was not recently, but I'll get bored of, <laughs> bored of eating. It's like yesterday I was doing this. <laughs> and, and then and then you get like through your 20 chicken nuggets and you have a sip of vanilla milkshake. You're like, yes, I'm ready for some more Isn't chicken nuggets. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I find like that's so fascinating well, I, to me. It's what, it, what an interesting paradigm to think of that the, the human body has got such an effective and efficient regulatory system when it comes to food. Actually, your body's systems are all very... Uh, they're all very effective and efficient when they're healthy and when they're in an environment that they kind of evolved to be in. But because we've changed our environment so drastically, it throws those things off. And the, the side effect of that is chronic illness or obesity. When we allow them to work the way they're supposed to, then we find that food regulation isn't that much of a problem. Um, just like other types of regulatory systems. You know, uh, Rob Wolf talks about, uh, he used the example of pornography and how that uh, literally rewires the brain to be so responsive to extreme novelty that you've got 20-year-old men suffering from erectile dysfunction because their brains have now been wired to respond to a situation that would never 
have existed. Because their girlfriend doesn't want to be like tied up, bent over the table. <laughs> yeah, right. Because yeah. she's, then- she's 17 years old. Yeah. <laughs> and videoed from like some gynecological standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or, or, or just having a, a, like access to a million different, you know, uh, women in, in pictures and all these different things. And so it rewires the brain. Well, that's what's happened with food. That's what's happened to us with food. We're in an environment where I can literally have any flavor I want within five minutes. And this has never existed ever in human history. And and because of that, we know that's the driver behind the market, that the market responds by feeding just that. So when you look at the foods that you buy at the grocery store, especially the processed ones, or in particular the processed ones, the vast majority of R&D, you know, research and development money goes into two places, how the palatability and the, and the marketing behind it. Yeah. Very, very little goes into nutrition. It's literally, this is how much goes into nutrition. Uh, okay, cool, everything's done. Throw in some, uh, some, some vitamins so we could say it's uh, vitamin fortified, and there we go. But it's not even vitamins. It's, um, uh, it, um, I'm thinking of iron particularly. They throw in iron filings. You know, so you, <laughs> you know, you know those, mag- know this you know those magnetic things that you, you know, those little iron filings. You used to play with them with magnets when you were a kid because they would like stick those like little. Is it like the dude, like the dude's face, and you make a mustache? That's what they yeah. put it. That's so what they- that's, and then it's iron fortified because they've thrown in iron filings, and you can actually I didn't do this. Know, there's some I did brilliant, not know that. There's some awesome YouTube videos. You can watch people extract iron filings out of cornflakes. So they like blend it up. And you know, create this sort of mush of cornflakes, and then you can use a magnet. Shut the to fuck pull up! Out. No, no, you should you should watch it. You I did not know that out. because you know. Then you say, "Well, there's iron in these in, in these cornflakes," and it's yeah, it's like eating some of your cast iron cooking pot. Like, did you know not- that? I had no idea. I That's did not horrible. know that. Wow. That's terrible. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to do that. No, no. I have to do that. I feel like I have to go test that out. That's crazy to me. That's terrible. So well, we've talked about like protein spiking and stuff, right? We, we talked about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Protein powders. Um, there's a, you know, independent laboratories have gone in and tested some of these protein powders and found what's called protein spiking where they will add individual amino acids because of the way the testing, right? So when you test the protein powder to see how many grams of protein there are per serving, you're testing individual amino acids, and based on those, that'll tell you, or nitrogen or whatever, will tell you how many grams of protein. So what these companies were doing was just putting those in their powder mm-hmm. so they could say 45 grams of protein per serving, when in reality it's 25 grams of protein per serving with like extra, you know, whatever amino acids just yeah. to show up on the test. Mm-hmm. And so it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a problem that we're running into, especially in the cosmetic fitness industry because so much of it is driven buy supplements. Mm -hmm. How do you guys deal with that working with, I know you guys do online coaching quite a bit. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with people who come to you and ask you like, I want to take all these supplements. I want to, these are the things I know to work. Like what are some of the things you talk to them about in that regard? Oh, we talk about the testing, right? So, I mean, I, I think everyone that's been through a bad health experience has tried taking a whole bunch of supplements to see if they help. And you realize that you just can't guess. It's it's like uh, shooting a shotgun from the hip. You just can't do that. You've really got to do some testing and find out which things you need and which things you don't. And and so that's our, our approach is we use urinary organic acids and we use blood chemistry and we use stool tests. Oh, very and, individualized. Yeah, so it's totally every single plan is, is bespoke. We're like, we're only going to give you something if we think you're going to benefit because we've done a test. Now, you said you had a personal story for how you got into all this. Did it, yeah. did it, did it, did it start that way or is that where you just kind of came to after? Yeah, Toronto? yeah. I, would, if, I, I sometimes wonder about that, where I would be now if, if, if none of this had happened, whether I'd still be sat in the back office of a hedge fund somewhere programming computers, which would be... <laughs> would be quite sort of awful and, and brilliant at the same time. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm British, obviously. I came to the West Coast in 2001 and I had a fantastic opportunity with Yahoo, the local tech company. We're here in San Jose. And so I'm seeing again all some of the, I used to live in Palo Alto. So it's kind of cool to see people with the word NVIDIA on their license plate and all of that. <laughs> so it kind of gets me quite excited. My undergraduate degree is in computer science. Uh, but I'm really active, fell in love with the West Coast lifestyle, surfing, um, mountain biking, kiteboarding, snowboarding. It's, it's an incredible place. You can do all these things mm-hmm. right here within a very short distance. And so fell in love with the lifestyle, got competitive on the bike, did some mountain bike races, started winning, upgraded, started winning some more, got a coach, started eating more food because I was doing more cycling. And you can guess the food I was eating was the stuff that was getting me into trouble and eventually the wheels came off the wagon, a lot of fatigue, um, but not related to exercise, you know, just normal fatigue during the day, like falling asleep under my desk and stuff like that. 
and then not being able to sleep at night. Absolutely the worst thing in the world, insomnia, one of the worst things I've ever experienced. And then just terrible sex drive and erectile dysfunction and bloating and all these terrible problems. And I went to my local medical doctor um, because we had fantastic health insurance, obviously, with the big tech companies. And he was worse than useless. He said, okay, so here's some Viagra for the erectile dysfunction. And then you should probably go and see a gastroenterologist, which I did. And the gastroenterologist was worse than useless. They said, oh, here's some steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. Oh, gosh. And, uh, you know, when those stop working, and they will stop working, then we can start cutting bits out. <laughs> and <laughs> Always treating the symptom, man. Uh, and uh, so I kind of knew as an engineer, you're like, this guy doesn't really seem like he understands what might be causing these problems. You know, as a, any engineer will tell you, if you want to solve a problem, you have to understand what caused it. And even as a mountain biker, there's a really good analogy that I think that every cyclist will understand that when you get a flat tire, you get a thorn or something stuck in your tire and the tire goes flat and you pull it all to bits and you pull out the tube and maybe there was no tube in there to begin with. You've got tubeless, but whatever. You put in a new tube. You have to understand what it was that, that made that tire go flat. Because if you just put in a new tube... It's going to happen up, again. It's going to happen again. <laughs> <laughs> so why do, why do doctors do something completely different from everyone else on the planet? It's just really strange. But I, was, I got really lucky. So I had this suspicion, but I got really lucky that I met my wife. And it's funny, you've just been talking about food quality. And so she just finished her master's degree in, in food science. And then you've got two options, really. You can either become a nutritionist or a dietitian. Or you can become a flavor chemist, which is one of these people that creates hyperpalatability in foods and makes them into a good business model. And she decided that both of those things were not for her, for obvious reasons, right? Like, I don't really want to be evil in this world. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and, and so she chose a different... She was actually working for a local company here selling school lunches, but that wasn't really much fun either. And she ended up at McKinsey. But yeah, that was where she was working when I met her. And she said, oh, you should really try an elimination diet before you go under the knife or take any of these drugs. And so that's what I did. And of course, it got fantastic results. It was absolutely amazing, like the transformation. And I measured some stuff in blood. High sensitivity C-reactive protein was one of the blood markers that I saw go from 7 to less than 0.5 in just a couple of weeks in, in changing my diet. So, you know, I was eating cereal for breakfast, sandwich for lunch, pasta for dinner, baking my own bread, you know, eating low fat yogurt with a ton of sugar in it, thinking I was doing the right thing. You know, what the cardiologist told me to eat turned out it was like a lot of nonsense. And then I went over to the diet that Rob Wolf described, you know, the, the paleo solution, that mm -hmm. original diet. And that was fantastic. And then I, I chose a more refined version of that, the autoimmune paleo diet that was even better for me. And that got me fantastic results. And then later on, I started thinking, oh, what else is possible? What else could I be doing here? Got into some of the advanced testing. And that was through podcasts. My entire reinvention is because of podcasting, listening to podcasts, doing podcasts, talking to people, heard about these advanced tests that you could do, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, yeah, just got fantastic results fixing the types of problems that I found on those tests. So isn't it fascinating that it still fascinates me, uh, be, mainly because I try not to get pissed off about it. So I let it fascinate me. <laughs> Where you, so, go, you go to a doctor with uh, a health problem, uh, an issue, a chronic problem, because let's, I mean, Western medicine is brilliant at treating acute uh, issues. Yeah, so you really have to understand what medicine does well. Right. And that's exact. So I'm a mountain biker and I, I feel like I throw medicine under the bus on a weekly basis on my podcast, but I really don't want to do that because as a mountain biker, the next time I, I crash and collapse my right, lung. Right, if you break, yeah, if you break, yeah, a, break I, a leg, you yeah, want... Yeah, <laughs> I want someone to call an ambulance still, please. They do a fantastic job on that. But if it's been something that's been going on for a while, if it's chronic... They're it's, terrible. It, the, it's, it's, yeah, it's the worst terrible. It's very good for acute issues. Infection, cut something out, Trauma. remove something you know, prevent me from dying this second. Western medicine is uh, second to none. It's the best, absolute best in the world. It's a, it's a, it's a godsend to mankind, but it is absolutely because of its strength in that particular area right. where they see the, they see the problem or the, or the symptom, treat the symptom right away, which makes it really good for acute issues. Also makes it terrible for chronic issues. And if you go to the doctor and you talk about having, if you go to the doctor right now and you say, listen, I am exhausted all day long. I'm just tired all day long. They will run a battery of blood tests. If those blood tests come back and show nothing's wrong with you according to the blood test, in other words, you don't have any major nutrient deficiencies, and we can talk about the ranges, by the way, that they use on blood yeah, tests. Yeah, you fit within 95% the 95 confidence right. intervals of the mean of the average person that, <laughs> that, does, takes, the blood that does the blood test. Right, yeah, we, could, we, could, we could talk about that, but let's just say everything's within those ranges, but you're still really tired. They're literally going to tell you you're crazy or right. no, you're fine. I think you're absolutely healthy. And it's like, 
I'm telling you I feel like shit and you're telling me I'm healthy. And at no point during our conversation have you asked me my diet, mm. my activity level, my sleep, my stress level. At no point have you ever asked me those things, which are by far the most important things. Literally, you are putting things in your mouth every single day that become a part of you. The first and most important thing you should look at when you have a chronic issue is, are these things I'm putting in my mouth affecting my chronic health? And none of them will even ask that. It's, here's, here's what's fine. I have a cousin, who young cousin, teenager, who had really bad acne, went to a dermatologist and was getting treatment for acne. And I don't necess- I don't see this side of my family that often, but then I saw them for a family function and we were talking about this. And she's like, oh, I heard you have a fitness podcast, whatever, mind if I ask your opinion? I said, absolutely. And so she asked me about her skin. I said, look, I'm not a dermatologist. I'm not an expert in skin. I said, but nutrition can play a very large role in what happens to your skin. And she's like, she laughed. And she goes, no, it doesn't. She goes, I already asked a dermatologist and they said, my nutrition has nothing to do with my skin. And I couldn't believe that they still will say something like that. And what's funny is people will say there's no science to support that. That's also bullshit. Mm, Some of yeah. the, there's 70-year-old there's studies that talk about the acne gut uh, access. They actually referred to it as is how eat what you eat can affect your skin. But what you eat can affect everything. And your thoughts can affect them as well. Here's another one that's great. You, doctors don't ask you about your thought process and your mindset. Uh, mm. Except when we do scientific studies, what's the thing that we control for every single time? The placebo effect. The placebo effect, in fact, is so powerful, we have, to, we have to make sure we control for it, but they will not acknowledge the fact that your thoughts may, in fact, affect your fatigue or oh, your this bloating. Is, or this is else. why we speak to the, the psychology. It took, it took a long time for me as a trainer. It must have taken close to 10 years before I really, you know, it took me uh, not helping thousands before I started to help thousands. You know, it, when you start to do these things that you've, you've been told by uh, the industry, like, oh, this is the way to help them. And you realize, man, I'm not helping any of these people. And it's because you're not addressing those. You're not addressing the relationship with food, the relationship with himself, and the relationship with exercise. It has to start there. If, if not, even if they see the results they're, they're looking for right now, it'll be short term. It won't be long lasting. And I think that's such an important topic. Yeah, and, and from an exercise standpoint, you know, we talk about relationship with exercise. We've also been fed, uh, it's, it's the same uh, message, right? Calories burned versus calories taken in. And so what people have deduced from that, uh, from an exercise standpoint is, I just need to burn more calories. Not about changing the way my body uses calories, but just about burning calories. So it becomes this very manual approach to calorie burn in which the more I move, the more calories I burn. Therefore, I'm just going to keep moving more and more, not realizing that the body is very, very effective Mm -hmm. and efficient at adapting. And it will adapt and it will slow down its calorie burn if you're just manually burning calories all the time. In fact, uh, there was some interesting studies done uh, recently, uh, not relatively recently, the last couple of years, where there were some scientists that went to study Um, some uh, modern hunter-gatherer societies. And I forgot the method that they used, but it was a pretty accurate uh, method is the way that they talked about it in the article, where they were uh, measuring the metabolic uh, rate of these hunter-gatherers. And they figured that these hunter-gatherers were going to burn like three times as many calories as the average person because their days were so active. I mean, they didn't sit at desks. They didn't work at computers. They were moving all day long uh, throughout the day. So like, oh, we're going to see these guys burning like... 4,000 calories. And the reason why they went to test them is because they knew how they ate and they didn't eat 4,000 calories. Like, how are these people not disappearing? They're not eating 4,000 calories, probably because they're hunter gatherers and it's hard to eat that many calories. And yet they're super active. And what they found was their metabolisms adapted so well to where they were burning not that many more calories than the average person. And it was because the body adapts to that, that, all that manual activity. And so when you talk to people about this, and I talk about resistance training, the importance of resistance training to modern humans, mainly because, not just because it strengthens your body, improves mobility and all that stuff, but because one of the main problems we're suffering from uh, in modern society is the overconsumption of food. And it's probably going to benefit you to have a faster metabolism. Nothing does that like resistance training. If we can turn the adaptation and switch it so that your body becomes less efficient with calories, it's going to benefit you more in modern societies. They've done some even better modeling recently looking at what they call the constrained versus versus the additive models of physical activity. So what um, the traditional person, doctor, personal trainer will think is that every calorie that your treadmill tells you you've burned, you can eat on top of what you would eat normally because that's a calorie that you've burned. But if you actually look at what truly happens, 
the it it it's um it's a uh, uh, it, it hits like a, a point where you only with through physical activity or exercise you can only maybe increase the amount of calories extra calories you burn in a day by about 200 so even if you keep exercising more and more and more what your body will then do the less of the time is you'll sit you'll sit more still or you know everybody sort of fidgets does these sort of like small movements maybe they get up and go and do something they feel motivated to do something the body just stops doing that naturally because you don't want to burn those extra calories you can't do it so actually the only you can you can burn about 200 extra calories you know if you're if you're looking at these studies and we and we're believing in you know calories in calories out purely um that's about all you can add and beyond that your body will either reduce the amount that you move the rest of the time to adapt, and you don't even know you're doing it, it's completely subconscious, or you will uh, re- produce less thyroid hormones, so you'll turn down your metabolism. So none of that, you know, anybody who thinks that they can burn a thousand calories on the treadmill, you know, you, uh, 800 of those calories, you're going to you're gonna make up for them somewhere else, well, and uh, that's not going to make any I, 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 It's so fascinating to me. I, I fucking love it, but it makes perfect sense because – the most complex uh, thing that we have found in the observable universe is the human brain. The second most complex thing is the metabolism. And it's extremely complex, and we think we understand all of it, but we understand very little of it. There's so much we don't understand. I mean, 20 years ago, who was talking about the microbiome and its effect on metabolism? Nobody. Nobody was really talking about the effect of the microbiome. We have animal studies now where they'll take mice and they'll do a fecal transplant from one mouse to the other, from an obese mouse to a skinny mouse or vice versa, and then all of a sudden this skinny mouse gets fat and this one gets skinny. I mean, you got to be – I mean, it's way more complex than we, so than we there's, think. So there's this huge hubris in – so whenever we talk about um, doctors and scientists, I feel like – well, first of all, I, I, I kind of like – I want to I want to say – you know, we want to help, right? So I'm a, I'm a traditionally trained medical doctor. You know, they're in a system that prevents them from being able to give the help that they want to give. Like if they had an hour to teach you about nutrition and like lifestyle and they've been taught that in medical school in the first place, they'd love to do that. They'd love nothing more than do, to do that. But they have seven minutes and they have literally no way to be able to help you do that. Um, but... Now I've completely forgotten the point that I was going to make, but there was, there was this, I was, I was going to say that I was going to say this story. So we have this friend um, who we works with. He's a neurologist. He's another. Uh, mm. He's a board certified neurologist. He's he's a he's a, a real medical doctor. He's leaving traditional neurology to sort of go out into the world and help help people improve their brain function, improve their brain health. And he has this great story about Angry Birds, and this is his analogy for modern medicine and and modern science, and it's. So imagine these aliens come down to Earth and they see that they find the game Angry Birds. It could be any game, right? And, you know, they they decide, okay, we're going to see who can be the best at Angry Birds. We're going to have a month, right? And we're going to split into two groups. We're going to have a competition and we're going to play against each other and whoever wins is obviously the best. There's two groups. One group is like, we are going to dig down into the code of this game and understand it as well as we possibly can. And then when it comes to the competition, we're going to manipulate the code in real time and then we're going to be able to win the game that way. And then the other group says, we're just going to play the game a lot and then we're going to win it that way. And anybody who thinks that they can manipulate game code in real time and understand it so that they could win a game is completely fucking bonkers, right? And it's exactly the same with pretending that you understand the level of biochemistry or physiology. And we pretend that we do, but we really, really don't. So a lot of the time that we say is just play the fucking just game. The what makes you healthy? <laughs> Eating real food, moving, getting outside, having a, a, a connection with your family. And do do I know the exact biochemical pathway of everything that happens when you do those things? Actually, no, I don't. But I know that it's going to help because you're playing the game. And even if you did, that's so uniquely different to each individual. Yeah. So that's where that's the great. That's such a great point. That's a great. Analogy. I love I love that saying. I'm going to use that. If you no, I, I'm I, gonna I steal that. I, I love that <laughs> analogy. And so like when I when I start like coaching or helping somebody this is what i used to do is i'd say okay because <clears throat> right away the assumption when you hire a personal trainer is okay where's my diet where's my workout routine right that's what i'm supposed to do you pay me for that i tell you how to eat i tell you how to exercise and i learned later on to flip that shit on its head because i realized i wasn't really helping anybody that direction so they hire me and i say okay this is what i want you to do don't do anything special and new for me don't try and eat any different than what you do don't try and exercise anymore just because now you have a trainer just I want you to pay attention. We're just going to track it for a week or two 
And then we're going to come back, sit down together, and we're going to discuss it. And then I pick one or two things that's happening either nutritionally or in their lack of activity and exercise, and I approve, I approve upon it. And most of the time, it looks something like this, because as Americans, there's some things that we tend to do. Uh, one, I see a lot of overconsumption of sugar and carbohydrates. We just don't need it that much, and we eat a ton of it. And then the lack of movement and exercise or the lack of fiber. There's a bunch of little things that people tend to do. And I'll pick one or two things, and they're normally very basic and and clients at first they always would push back like that's all I'm doing I'm like absolutely for a very long time now you've been eating 70 to 90 grams of sugar I'm not going to cut it all the way out from you we're going to cut it back by about 30 grams every day let's see how your body responds you're only stepping about 3,000 steps every single day because you get in your car you drive to work you sit at your desk you come home all I want you to do is to walk for a half hour every day that's it that's all we're doing nothing else for right now and then we're going to build upon that and when you start to set these realistic goals for people and you and you start to help them connect those dots, it becomes a lot easier. And I think a mistake that a lot of professionals make is we get so caught up in which program is better and this diet is better for this and getting into all these, you know, which one, which one is – the science shows that there's a little bit better if we do it this way. Or it's a little bit better if we do it that way. And it's like, Jesus, that's – way over complicating let's play the fucking game yeah. mm-hmm. let's start playing the game and let's you know what when you die when you die the first on the first level we're going to learn from that mistake <laughs> and then the next time we're going to get past that yeah. and then you're going to hit another little road bump and then we're going to talk about that and we're going to get past that and it's amazing you just slowly build on that Adam, can you talk about some of the clients that you work with? And I, I don't want you to use the word clients. I want you to talk about a specific person that came to Mind Pump and what were their specific goals? Well, you, we know, don't, you, sh- you know who you should talk about? You should talk about one of our OGs. Talk about Rochelle. I mean, there's so many people. First I know of all, there's so many people, but well, let me, let me, you let can't me. talk in the general terms. Else okay, people, so you talk to no one, right? You have to talk to someone specifically. Else I you will give no you an example of something that just happened literally like, what, three, four days ago. So I had a client. Now, we don't, just so you guys know, so and the audience understands, uh, Sal, myself, and Justin, we don't train clients anymore. So we don't handle one-on-one cases. Yeah, that's okay. So you but, can talk about the programs. Mm-hmm. So I had somebody about a year and a half ago, and it was a friend of a friend, real smart girl, uh, hire me to help her coaching. And just like I just explained the process, her name was Jessica. And she probably needed to lose about 25 to 30, 30, 30 pounds, right in that range, and when she hired me, I had to have this long conversation of, I'm not going to put you on this extreme diet. I'm not going to start making you exercise like crazy because this was her pattern in the past. Mm. Gave her the same exact advice that I'm giving right now. Now, and what did she want? What was what did she want more than anything else? She, you know, like most people when they hire you, everyone is very aesthetic focused. Right. Mo- right. Most people want to look better. That's right? fine. Right. It's okay. And it's okay. But what I like to do with someone like that is I like to help them make that connection with themselves too. that. And like Sal said earlier at breakfast that, you know, I want you to train because you love yourself, not because you don't love yourself right now. So mm. helping them make that connection because it, otherwise what happens, and this has happened many times where you get a client in great shape and they, it hasn't changed for them. Right. They, so they're thinking I'll be happy when exactly. And then you they have to be happy now. Exactly. <laughs> and this is, so this part is important. And then also teaching her. So I remember telling her, I said, okay, Jessica, this is what we're going to do. And by the way, what I used to do as a trainer was it was mandatory that you had a minimum of three months with me. Cause I learned really quick mm. that I wasn't going to be able to it, doing it the right way. I wasn't going to give people that 30 day change turnaround that they wanted, which would normally convince the average person to resign and keep training with you. So you mm. had to get locked in in a contract with me. And I knew that because I needed time to show you how this is going to work. And so that's what I would do. So she's locked in three months with me. First month goes by. Mind you, she wants to lose 25 to 35 pounds. And I'm telling her when I first assess her diet, because she's only eating about 1,500 calories. 1,500 calories. She's about 160 pounds, 160, 163 pounds at this time. And, and she's only eating about 1500 calories and she's only, she's only moving, I think a four to 6,000 steps a day is what she was. Cause I have all clients use wearables to track. So I have some sort of a feedback on their movement. So this is where she's at month goes by and we haven't lost a single pound, but I have her eating 1900 something calories. And I tell, and I explained to her. I said, I know that you, your ultimate goal is for us to drop you down twenty five plus pounds, but I need to explain to you what's going on and what we're doing and why we're doing this. And that's, I could have lost you ten pounds this month. 
I could have reduced your calories from your 15, 1600 down to 1100. Oh we could God. have. How much lower can you go though? Do you think? <laughs> right. But I mean, this is what happens though. This is what mm. people that become so hung up on the, the calories in versus calories out mentality. This is what they end up doing. And this is what she would do. Or she, this is what like most yo-yo dieters do. They, they're either on the wagon or they're off the wagon. When they're on the wagon, they're restricting calories. They're ex- exercising like crazy and they lose their weight. Then they realize they can't maintain that. Then they balloon back up and it's this vicious cycle. Mm-hmm. And what I'm trying to do is break the cycle from her and explain to her that this is what we have to do. Now, I'm going to fast forward this story because what ended up happening was I, she was with me for about five months. I eventually got her all the way up to where she was consuming about 2,600 calories a day, not putting on any weight. We only, so you're introducing these gradually. You're not saying an overnight change. It's yeah. a gradual reintroduction. Real, it took a, it took Along a, with good resistance training. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. She's, I've, I'm, I've introduced her into MAPS, which the foundation of MAPS, I'll tell you what's so special about our programming, is we learned really quick, uh, especially in talking about a female right now, most women gravitate towards, you know, high repetitions, isolation type exercises, target my booty, target my arm, my, my arm fat, my belly fat. And, and that's their kind of mentality training. Well, maps, the foundation of it is strength based compound movements, deadlifting, squatting, overhead pressing the big, the big movers that give you the big bang for your buck. And we know that when we introduce those to this type of a client, their body responds because right. it's, it's never moved like this is never. And because they've stayed away from it because they don't want to get big, bulky muscle, yeah. you know, like, Oh, I don't want to lift those exercises. That's going to make me big and bulky. So you got to dispel all that. Right. So we've done this, right? So she's at 2,600 calories. I think at that time we'd only lost about five or eight pounds. So we're nowhere near yet her ultimate goal. We end up having to go different directions. She ends up moving across the country and uh, we, we go separate ways for about a year and a half. Now, her ultimate goal, why she originally hired me, was to get her ready to compete for a bikini show. That was her goal. Oh, wow. She wanted to lose this thir- these 35 pounds, and then she wanted to get ready for a show. And I refused to get train her for a show until I fixed her metabolism. That's what I told her. I said, listen, I'm not going to throw you in a show in, in 12 weeks when your metabolism is like this. I will, right. I will just destroy you, you know? And so she trusted me, and she allowed me to do all this with her. But- Eventually, what she did was she went and hired a coach that would. So she hired a coach about, this is just just as a recent story, right? This just happened three months ago that she hired a coach. She just competed two weekends ago, and she did a show. And she got all the way down to 120, I want to say 123 was her weight, right? And she was the smallest she's ever been. People complimenting her like crazy. Now, meanwhile, she's close. She's connected to my girlfriend, Katrina, and they, they communicate and they talk. And she would share with her the things that she was doing to get ready for her show. Two hours plus of cardio every single day, eating 1,300 calories, no fruit in her diet, just whatever it took to get her down. And she got down to this goal. She's never seen her body like this, not since she was a kid. So she was excited. She did something that I was very proud of her and that I thought was really smart, though. She actually took her body fat test. So she went and got... Uh, a hydrostatic weight, which is what I made her do when she was with me. So I wanted her to test so we could look at her lean body mass and mm. could show her what her fat mass was. And that way over time, even though she might not see the scale move down, I could show her that we've changed her body composition. So she knew what where she was with me. And I had gotten her down to about, I think, 15.8% body fat was where she at. So mind you, she's down 25 something pounds or whatever. She's hit stage. She's the small she's ever been. She takes her body fat test but she doesn't want to see the results. She doesn't want it to mess with her getting up on stage later that night. So, And she emails me and says, hey, I really want to open up my body fat test and I want to look at it with you and I want to talk about it, but I don't want to look at it until after my show. So I go to her show and I watch her and I see her and we stand there and we open it up and we open up the email and she's all excited to see how low she's gotten because she's down to this small as she's ever been. And she and I and I see it right away because I've looked at these tests a million times. So I see the number and I'm waiting for her to, to see it. And she looks and she looks at the number and it's 17.9% body fat. And she's like, is this right? This can't be right. Hmm. How am I, I, when I was with you and we weren't doing any cardio and I was 20 pounds heavier, I was at 15 something percent body fat. How am I, I, I'm on, I just got off stage how am I at 17.9% body fat? This doesn't make sense to me. I said, yeah, because what we what ended up happening was you were doing so much cardio and you're eating so little that you were telling your body it doesn't want any of that weight. So it was losing muscle and it was losing fat. It was dropping everything like crazy. Mm-hmm. And she had absolutely, and I said, now this is where this is really important. So I'm helping her right now. 
as a friend. Like she's not, she's somebody who's a, a close friend of mine. And I'm really nervous for her because she has now let her body get adapted to two to three hours of cardio every day and consuming 1300 calories to have this body. And I said, you know, more than ever, what you do now is extremely important because I know you hit a goal of yours, which was really important of you to get on this stage, but you have absolutely just killed your metabolism. And if you don't maintain this activity level and this low of calorie, you're going to see your body just balloon up really quick. Mm. So there's a, a point there, which is that so 17 point something percent of 120 mm -hmm. is less than 15% of 160, right? Mm -hmm. So she has lost fat, but she's also lost lean mass, right? She's lost a lot to try and get down to that weight. So a in greater terms percentage of, the balance, of her yeah, weight yeah. is yeah. body fat. Than and before. talk about a mind fuck for the, and this is what happens. Now this is, I wanted to use, share this story with you because I think it's a great extreme analogy. What happens to everybody? Mm -hmm. I really believe this happens to a majority of people that exercise is, but she's just the extreme example is we come into it with this idea of you're either on or you're off. I was eating all this bad food. I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't exercising. Now I'm going to go after my goals and I'm going to hammer the, it's, you know, no days off, beast mode, get after it as hard as you possibly can, restrict calories. And what we don't, what people don't realize is how much damage they're really doing to their body by approaching it this way. And then you, you actually lose weight because you, you'll lose weight that way. Yeah. Take somebody, cut their calories in half, increase your mm -hmm. exercise by two times of what you're doing. Yes, you'll get smaller. 100% you'll get smaller. She did. She lost body fat. You know, she has less fat on her than she did when she was at 15% and heavier weight with me. But the ratio of muscle to fat and what, and a lot of people don't understand and her that. metabolism is just well yeah because people down. don't understand that okay so for muscle and for fat to be on our body they, they're both tissue and they both require calories to stay on there and muscle requires a lot more calories than fat does to stay in our body so she, now that she's dropped that 20 something pounds she's lost a ton of expensive tissue that requires a ton of calories to yeah. sustain on her body in turn doing what Sal said slowing your metabolism down so this is it's all about the signals you send uh, you know when you're when you're training and eating it's what type of adaptation are you asking for of your body if you're asking for uh, your body to become more efficient with calories when that's the adaptation it's going to go towards and it's going to slow itself down this well, is why if you train for endurance lots of endurance uh, athletes their 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 metabolic rates tend to slow down they tend to lose but it's not you're not burning muscle i want to be clear too cuz sometimes people be like don't burn muscle it's like you're not burning muscle your body's just adapting in a more it's efficient way it's doing what you're telling it to do exactly. Exactly. exactly exactly you know and to bring it back to our programming and how we've designed things this is you know we've been playing the game of angry birds for 20 years <laughs> We've been playing, so we fucking know how to play this game. I might not be able to write the code for it, that's for sure. <laughs> but I've 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 played a lot of levels, and you know, so is Sal, so is Justin, and so when we created maps, the the, the real magic. And so we've got all these crazy reviews and results, like oh my god, just mind blowing. Everybody thinks we're like this magician. We've figured out the perfect program. Like, no, it's not the perfect program. We just understand. We understand the average American and the average American, especially somebody who's trying to lose body fat, reduce weight, which we know is the majority of our audience. So right? that's that's who you're programming for in general, right? Because because so, you, yeah, so you, which you was the who's program? the target? Who's yeah, the so, who, 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 so if I'm Jessica now listening to this, which program would I if I go to mindpumpmedia.com, what program would I sign up for if I had this aesthetic goal to fix her metabolism? Uh, Maps Anabolic would be the program okay? Uh, because it's more we consider our foundational program because it's strength and muscle based maps aesthetic is your we have a uh, more of a competitor program for when you hit stage but it's much higher volume of training requires uh, it's much more taxing on the body and for someone whose metabolism has been damaged through competing they are better off taking a step back focusing on those kind of roots our programs are designed to work and so we've maps anabolic so you that's a tough answer what you're asking right now so you're as, you're asking me to give you a generic answer to something that yeah. we, we oh, well we can be specific and say well, for jessica the, the like same, what, so jessica listening right now what would she sign so up for? jessica now you know could handle maps maps black the maps aesthetic program but it jessica just getting started with me i had her on maps anabolic mm. and that's because all the programs we we slowly increase the volume and it's designed to go over an entire year okay. so we try and take people we re reduce the amount. So the MAPS anabolic program is either two or three days a week of lifting. That's it. Two to three days a week, full body routines and the big compound lifts. Mm. And we know we know that most people are, one, missing missing those lifts. Two, 
don't train for strength because people attach strength training to power lifters or Olympic lifters. So they, so that's, so if I had an Olympic lifter, I wouldn't start him on maps red because he's been training that way for such a long time. He might benefit more from like our maps performance program. Mm. Which so is, how do you figure this out though? That's why I've been, so I've been listening to the podcast probably 20 hours in so, the last month. And I'm like, what the, you know, so, so I'm a mountain this is, biker, this my is back a, hurts. Where do I go? What this do is I do a great, This is a great question. And this is actually something that we're in the process of improving because mm. we, what we did, we spent so much time on creating this great content, this information, all the podcasts that we have a horrible sales funnel. Mm. Like we, we're not big marketers. We did not, we did, we weren't marketers and built it like most businesses like us that are our size built a great marketing tool or system. Right. And then they came out with all the stuff later. We're the opposite. We're just now starting to build, like we don't capture people just diet dropping in on us. You right. have to have been a listener for a long time to have put together right. all this information that you're asking me right now, because we've, we've prided ourselves on trying to individualize it for people. And we don't want to just offer generic programs and say, Hey, this is for everybody. So well, but you I, must I, have had somebody. You must have had somebody in mind when you were designing the programs, right? Because, yes, yes. So you know who you designed the programs for. Who the avatar is? For yeah, the you know who the avatar is. But then you getting those avatars out in the world to come in and then recognize which. So, of your so it's really, it really we, the best way to do it um, is to uh, come out with a specific type of adaptation at, or, or avatar that the program is designed for. But that doesn't mean if you want that goal that that's necessarily the best program because it depends also where you're starting from. So if we take it all the way back to the mm. first uh, MAPS program, and I, I have a, uh, I can tell you a client story, and actually he's sitting in here right now. It's Doug, our producer. Oh, yeah, so tell a Doug story. That's yeah. interesting. So Doug, uh, the way I met Doug, Doug came to me through a chiropractor that he saw because he had back pain, and the chiropractor told him, you got to see Sal. He can help you with uh, fixing that pain. Now, when I met Doug, Doug already had lots of experience with resistance training. He'd been working out since he was a teenager, lifting weights. He'd follow, he'd followed all the bodybuilding routines, always wanted to look muscular and be strong, uh, followed Body for Life. I don't know if you guys remember Body for Life yeah. by Bill Phillips. Followed that to a T, took all the supplements. And so when I sat down with Doug and we talked about this, first he said, I have back pain, but then we talked about his other goals, which were, I want to build muscle. I want to have a six pack. I've never looked like that before and I've been working out my entire life. I just think I have bad genetics. And so I asked him, well, what do your routines look like? Well, I do body part splits. I work out four or five days a week in the gym. And so I said, okay, you're going to see me twice a week. And I don't want you to go to the gym after that. And we almost had, I almost had, I really had to sell that to him because he was in dis such disbelief when I said that to him. I was going to say, so, yeah, I mean, and you did it as well. I mean, there's this woman, Jessica, who thinks she needs to restrict calories and work on specific body parts. And then somehow magically you got her to stop thinking that and do what you said. <laughs> yeah, and how you do you just do said that? this like, how do you do that? How you've got someone that's got it fixed in their mind that they've got to do one thing and then you're telling them to do I'm something I'm a very, else. very good salesman. Oh, really? Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> we, so we sat, well, I mean, we sat down and I explained it to him. And so at we the end play, of the day- We played this game a lot. At, at the, <laughs> the, <laughs> we didn't come out being great yeah. at the game. It took us and some time. At the end of the day, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes have to tell people like, I'm going to ask you to trust me one time, but I promise if you trust me right now, okay. I'm not going to have to ask for your trust again. And so luckily, Doug trusted me. We did two days a week full body focused on compound movements and little by little progressed into three days a week of full body type routines. Uh, we phased this workout. So Adam talked about the, the programming of MAPS Anabolic, but it is more complex than just you know, full body workouts two or three days a week. There's also phasing of the workouts where you're focusing on different types of adaptation where one phase is we're training in the central nervous system adaptation phase where we're, we're in the one to five rep range, for example, or we're training a phase for hypertrophy, more of your classic, you know, eight to 12 reps or more of your sarcoplasmic hypertrophy where we're trying to build more of the non-muscle fiber structures within muscle, you know, increase its uh, ability to store things like glycogen and blood flow. So you're getting more of the pump. Um, and then there's what are called trigger sessions, which are unique to MAPS programs. Uh, all of our MAPS programs have some kind of a frequency builder in them. And the MAPS anabolic program was the first one. And we, I, I injected what are called trigger sessions. And trigger sessions really take advantage of the fact that you can send a small muscle building signal to your body without having to cause muscle damage. And a lot of people believe that the only way that you tell the body to build muscle is by causing muscle damage. 
That's one way, and that's also one of the biggest ways you can do it. But there's lots of little ways, right? You can change your hor- we can change the hormonal signal. That's an easy one. I can give you testosterone, change nothing else about your routine, and you're going to build muscle. But there's also other signals that you can manipulate, and one of them is simple mechanical signaling through these low these low intensity kind of frequent type of movements. And we see this. We observe this in every day, uh, every single day. When you see people who For example, you look at mechanics or plumbers who don't lift any weights, but take a look at their hands and forearms. Very, very developed. (laughs) And they're they're not breaking muscle down. They're not getting sore. It's that frequent signal of stimulation. So I I figured that out and I said, okay, how can I add that to some of these other things that I've learned about resistance training? And we came up with the trigger session concept, which in a nutshell, on your days off, you do these very light pumping sets with maybe resistance bands that you can do anywhere. And there's a specific way you do them that we found that works real effective, but you do these on the days in between. And what ends up happening, and we know there's a little bit of this now through science, is that when you send a really loud muscle building signal, like let's say today I work out really hard and I lift weights and I do everything right, I'm going to elevate the muscle protein synthesis signal for about, studies will show 48 to 72 hours is the general uh, range, and then it starts to decline after that. If we add trigger sessions to that, the theory is I'm going to keep that signal elevated for a little bit longer. And in practice, that's exactly what trigger sessions seem to do. Well, not to mention you're also increasing blood flow, you're increasing oxygen, movement, nutrients to the muscles because you're moving them. All all of those things. And so injecting this, this simple technique, which by the way, if you're listening and you don't want to change your routine, you don't have to. Just throw this in there, just on your days off or whatever. Do some pumping sets for target muscle groups, so it's five to ten minutes. Mean, I'm not sure what I know what you mean by pumping sets. I've been lifting so weights yeah, since I was 17. I've no idea. Yeah, but you, uh, have you read many like bodybuilding magazines? No, no, yeah, so that's why. Right. So, the, so, so short, l- like real short. You're talking five to ten minutes, um, you know, with rubber bands, bicep okay. curls. You're aiming for a little bit of a burn, get a little bit of a Not pump trying of the to do damage. You're not trying okay. to get you, sore. You want to feel it, but you're not trying to work out. And what you're doing is you're keeping that muscle building signal elevated and you're also sending other signals and you're also facilitating recovery because what I found with trigger sessions through uh, lots of experience now through clients, for example, one of the first things that Doug noticed when I had him apply trigger sessions was, holy cow, like I'm recovering faster from my hard workouts and he's able to increase his, his intensity and volume even further. And so these are some of the core concepts of our MAPS programs. If you look at our MAPS programs, the workouts at least, the workout ones, because we also have uh, MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro, which are more of your assessment model type programs. But the actual workout-based ones, they all follow this 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 formula, this concept of you have your, uh, your main muscle building signals, your frequency building signals that you inject in between, whether it's your trigger sessions or focus sessions or mobility sessions, and you phase your workout so that you can focus on a particular type of adaptation for a particular period of time. It's usually two to four weeks before moving to one that, that, is, that is complementary to the previous one. And so when you plug that all in, what you get is you get maximized programming and it's a lost art, unfortunately, with working out. Well, that's Especially the, re- in the, the reason why it works so well and why Mind Pump has been so successful is because we know there's a huge issue. There's an over application of intensity and an under use of frequency. And in our opinion, it's one muscle of, building. For yeah, sure. when it comes to building muscle, when people want to build muscle, burn fat, there is the over application of in- intensity, the under application of frequency and simply teaching people the way to do that correctly is a major game changer for about 80 percent. We would say people there's always going to be an exception to the rule, right? If you got if you have a guy like I ex- gave that example, if you were a power lifter and you all of a sudden just purchased our maps anabolic program and you did phase one you're not going to see that through those first three weeks you're not going to see the same change as the average person the average person doesn't lift and train that way it'll be such a different adaptation for them their body will respond mm-hmm. and that's what happens and we knew that we knew that when we created it and we phased it that way we knew that a majority of people as soon as they started that program instantly they would see a change in their body never done trigger sessions before never trained heavy compound type lifting i mean and then people are just getting response like crazy. Then now we've built that trust. Now we can teach you all the other programs, the other phases, what they're for. And I think, in my opinion, the most revolutionary thing that we've done is Maps Prime Pro and Maps Prime, which that was the biggest piece for us was creating a assessment to make it more individualized. You know how hard that was, by the way? Could you imagine <laughs> trying to create a self-assessment tool for the average person? 
where yeah. they have to be able to assess themselves following kind of instructions. Very, very difficult thing to so do. So tell us about the types of assessment that they do. So uh, with Maps Prime, what we did, so Maps Prime, the, the, the first, not Prime Pro, but Prime, we, were, we came together and when we, when we put programs together, we never know what we're going to do until it starts to come out of us, until we start to put things down. And with Maps Prime, we really realized that people, when you think of warming up, for example, what do, what, do, what do you think you're doing when you're warming up? Why am I warming up? Because oh, the dog needs to go out and take a pee. That's my warm up. <laughs> <laughs> so it literally is. I hate warming up. Yeah. So people Most do, people prevent injury, right? That's it. <laughs> prevent injury, get the blood flowing, get the heart rate going, but get that's crust out of my eyes, right? That's, that's <laughs> what's, what most of us think of a warm up is. Yeah, that's right? what we're taught. We're taught like, okay, it helps prevent injury. At the absolute least, uh, a warm up should do that. But what it can do at its most is uh, is groundbreaking when you You're properly when you properly prime the body now when you do your very uh, effective exercises like a squat or a deadlift or a, a power clean or an overhead press or whatever you're going to maximize the signal you get from that by priming your body properly. The problem that we encountered with priming riding, it neurologically. Yeah, right. so that's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're teaching. We're trying to teach people the the proper recruitment patterns, and we we have known again from playing the game for so long that most people that come in and hire you have poor recruitment patterns because they've sat at a desk for many years or they've played a sport a lot and they so they have these issues they have this chronic pain going on mm-hmm. and they have they don't have a bad back they don't have bad knees they have poor recruitment patterns and so now their joints it's just are, dysfunction right and their their body's it, not moving if properly if you take somebody who has got a uh, really bad uh, recruitment patterning and they're not getting good hip extension for example and you just say, oh, good, okay. And they come to you and they say, I want to work on my butt. I want to build my glutes. And you just have them squat and deadlift because those are traditional you know, butt building exercises. But they don't have a good recruitment pattern. They don't have a good connection to their glutes. They're going to find very poor results from those exercises. They're going to get just lots get bigger, of quads. bigger legs. Just <laughs> bigger quads. And so a, a thing that we would do as trainers is I would prime them before squats. And depending on the individual, but generally I do something like a hip thrust or something that I'm going to get them to fire the glutes and squeeze them and maybe de- maybe kind of take hip flexors out of the movement and change their posture a little bit. Then we do the squats and deadlifts and now they feel them more. So, that, But the challenge we encountered with prime was priming is so different from person to person. Like I can't prime a bench press the same for everybody because this guy might have you know, tight pecs and overactive lats and this person might have an issue with shrugging their shoulders and they have a poor recruitment pattern in their shoulders. And how do we prime each person individually? And so what we did is we broke the body down into three zones, three movements that kind of generally cover everything. You do these three tests, which we call the compass, based on whether or not you pass or fail. So it's very easy. So rather than saying this little part right here is not working, whatever, pass or fail. If you fail, it points you in this direction. And then this is what you do to prime your workouts. Because regardless of the movement you're doing, this is the recruitment pattern that you're demonstrating. So your priming should look like this. Mm. So that's what Prime was. Now with Prime Pro, Prime Pro was correctional. It is correctional in nature. So rather than teaching how to prime your workouts, what Prime Pro is doing is we're examining areas of the body you may have pain and dysfunction in, and we're trying to, to correct those problems as separate from your workouts. And the reason why it's separate from your workouts is when you're trying to correct a true issue with, let's say, my hips, I have dysfunction in my hips, and it's causing me pain, the best way to alleviate that, or not alleviate, to, excuse me, to correct that is through lots and lots of frequency. It is not through intensity. So if I'm trying to correct an imbalance in my shoulder, I need to practice that all day long because that signal needs to win out the other signal that I send all day long, which is sitting or, you know, whatever. Mm. And so prime pro is designed differently in that. If you look regard. at each one of our programs, they, each of them from maps, anywhere prime prime pro, the aesthetic, the, each one of them was an answer to what we thought was a problem in the industry. And I'll give an mm. example. Uh, one of the first episodes that we came out and said was why we don't CrossFit. So we created a bunch of shit because we said, we don't CrossFit. Here are the reasons why we don't CrossFit. So then we got a lot of people saying back to us, well, then what if I like that way of training? I like, I like the way it's designed. I like those exercises. I like, well, how would you guys put it together? So we created MAPS Performance. And that really was the answer for someone who likes those type of movements, but it's programmed in a much smarter way than just doing the wad of the day. 
And so Maps Aesthetic was inspired by when I got ready for a show and I competed and I saw all this pro this poor programming on all these professional athletes, all these Bo- bodybuilders, all these bodybuilders and men's bikini, or, uh, men's bikini, women's bikini, <laughs> right? That's what they call them. All, all these competitors were having they had terrible programming. These coaches would just over apply uh, intensity, train the shit out of them, starve them to death to get them in shape. And I'm like, no, there's a smart way to progressively overload the body to get it ready for a show. And so that's what inspired that program. When you look at maps anywhere, you look at what are the most popular programs at home? Are these insanity and P90X and plyometric? Like, get the fuck out of here. Not everybody should be doing that. So our answer with with Maps Anywhere was the answer to how you should program an at-home program. Our Maps Prime and Prime Pro really was the answer to all the poor chiropractors, I feel like. Because how many people get stuck in that, go see a chiropractor, he adjusts me two to three times a week, I feel better, I go back, see him next week, adjust me, feel better, when they're not, again, we talked about this earlier, addressing the root cause of Mm -hmm. something. They find the pain, they adjust them for a little bit, they feel better for a couple days, and then they go back to their poor recruitment patterns, and again, this happens Mm -hmm. again. So we are trying to help people and tell them, listen, it's not just an adjustment that you need, you need to move better. And if these are the areas that you're having joint pain, here are some movements that are going to help you move better. And we teach that through the program. So if you were to kind of give a generic, because I, I know I was dodging you a lot on giving you like this. Yeah, I know you want to speak to everyone, but by speaking to everyone in a way, you're speaking to no one. Yeah, it's a very good point. And I, yeah, I, I get really terrified by the complexity of it all. You know, I've sure. been, I, I, we, we were talking about this. I mentioned that I've been working with Mike T. Nelson and in his initial Great program. Great guy, by the way. He is fantastic. He got great. So I'll, I'll tell you this story. Um, at the beginning of this year, my back was hurting. My lower back was hurting quite a bit. It was, seemed to be getting worse. And my ankles were hurting. And so I went to, I'd interviewed Mike a couple of times. I thought, he's a really great guy. He's got an, an MS in, in biomechanics. And we spent a, a bunch of time on the phone. And I sent him some videos. And he put together a program. And I didn't get a lot of it done because it was so complicated. I was terrified by the complexity. And I'm one of those all or nothing people where I'd like, oh, shit, if I can't do all of this, then I'm not going to do any of it. And so I I worry about these online programs. I'm like, oh, my God, is this going to be really complicated? I'm I'm not going to be able to, I won't have half the equipment. No, uh, one one thing that we, that's what we pride ourselves on. Exactly. This is why you would love, and this is what we try to do. We're trying to bridge that gap Mm. because of the the brilliant minds like, like who we're talking about and others out there. Um, we, we de- I mean, we partnered with a uh, Dr. Brink to create these programs. And mm-hmm. what we are good at is disseminating information. That's because we've been playing the game so well. I don't know the code that I can't break the science and the code down really well, but I can play the game. And so if I've got somebody who's explaining it to me, I can take that information and go like, oh, you know what? I know how to help this apply to the average right. person because otherwise you can lose them and all of this overwhelming bits of information, which is why I just gave you that analogy of, you know, our programs are far more in depth than just, it's the answer to this, it's the answer to that. But I think that's an easy way for people to think about that. Like, you know, hey, these are how bodybuilders train. A lot of them train the wrong way. If you wanted to look like that, this is a better way to program chiropractors, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. CrossFit mentality. Like, these are better ways to program it. There's a lot of science that goes into it, which Sal was starting to get to. But sometimes I stop him when he goes that far in depth because I feel like some people get lost. Like, people don't don't understand they, they appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> well that's the that's the beauty of the show is the dynamic of, of, of yeah. us going back and forth mm. and being able to communicate i should finish that story actually because mike responded beautifully to my objection to his complexity and he greatly simplified the program and he did a really good job of working with the weights the equipment that i got off craigslist right just like one bar and a, and a chin-up bar and that was it and he got fantastic results for me and i've done a bunch of bike races this year where my lower back that's didn't fantastic. hurt at all. I, and that's what I really care about. And I wanted to hear you, you know, listening to the Mind Pump podcast, I wanted to hear you talk more about that, like, because yeah. that's what people really care about. Like, or what I really cared about was completing this 133 mile bike race with my lower back not hurting. That's like worth any amount of money to me. You know? <laughs> What's tough too in, in, in fitness in particular, because we were, you know, born in the fitness industry and, and one of the motivations behind Mind Pump was some of our anger towards how the fitness industry tends to market mm. and do things that we are very, uh, it's very difficult for us to do. Cause we know, I know for a fact the most effective way to sell anything 
uh, in fitness is to show a before and after and uh, show a personal story. Yeah. We have done none of that. And, yeah, Facebook and, won't let you do that. Have you noticed that? You can't, like, even oh, if I don't you know, show they don't two, let you do that anymore. Yeah, so if you can post something that's not actually a before and after, it's just two pictures of the same person, then an algorithm will say, hey, that's a before and after, and they won't let you. Wow, it. I didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but, wow. But that's a very effective way of selling yeah, things. Yeah, of course. To show before of course. and after. Transformation. And, and yeah, to definitely. tell a personal story. Right. And it's tough for us to do that specifically because we hate it so much. Because it's been it's been manipulated for uh, so long, yeah. like you don't realize. People Which is don't why realize, we dance around stuff. We like do. That when someone asks people don't you. realize. Yeah. People don't realize this, but like when they take when you do you, when you do a before and I know this because I know people in the industry. When they take a before and after, usually what they'll do is I'll go to someone like Adam. He's a professional IFBB physique competitor, and he just finished a contest. And I'm going to take his pictures. Well, that's his after. People don't realize this. Uh, that's his after. Then I'm going to tell Adam, we're going to pay you X amount of dollars, and I want you to get really fat, gain like 30 pounds, so I can take your before picture. And there's your before and after. A lot yeah. of the photos, a lot of the photos are done that way. Not to mention the you know, you know, makeup, tan. Four programs, the, four the supplements, four tan, whatever. The, they yeah, all do that. Photoshop. They, Photoshop. They all do that. However, human nature, people, uh, I could talk about science all day long. I could talk about how things work all day long, but people like testimonial. That's just what registers in our brain is like, you know, I could hear a thousand random people tell me how awesome a restaurant is, but if my good friend tells me that restaurant's awesome, I'm probably going to go there, Mm. you know? And so it's just, it's very difficult for us because we want to do things differently, but we also know that this over here is the most effective way to do well, it. Well, I would encourage you to get over that because, <laughs> you know, if you're sitting on something that's powerful and has the ability to help a lot of people, then that's a good you point. should be using we're, those, we're, we're whatever get, means you we're, need to. We're getting, to there. We're getting there. We yeah. just we just hired. It's funny you talk about this. Yeah, we're, we're this is what we're in the process of doing right now. We hired, uh, but it was very, very important to us when we started this that we weren't, we'd all, we'd all had other, we're all serial entrepreneurs. We've all had businesses doing other things. We started this not because we needed to make an income off of it. So we all agreed that we were going to keep our integrity through it. And yes, it has fucked us financially for quite some time. <laughs> yes, it has. Okay? And we are very, very aware of that. That's okay, though. And we were we were okay with that because we knew that. And, and that's right now the people that buy. So, you know, give people that understand and pay attention to numbers and stuff like that. We do somewhere between seventy five to 100,000 unique impressions on our website every month. The people that purchase, 100%. All of them are people that have listened to the podcast for a long time, mm. and and we're okay with that. We're okay our, with that our right website's now. Website shit right now. I mean, yeah, it's not it's at. not designed to catch to someone to land on it and go like, oh my god, this is for me. Yeah, it's not cold traffic. It's hot coming from the podcast. Right, and and we're and we're working it, but we waited until one. We had the revenue to where we could hire a team, and we, let me tell you, we've we've gone through three already and fired all of them right away. We've hired them, paid them, fired them right out because. If you don't understand our message and you don't see what we're, because we're trying to change this. Mm. We're trying to be different. We're trying, if we want to just do what everybody else is doing, absolutely, we can make, we can increase our income easily by 30 to 40% more revenue just by playing that game. Mm -hmm. Clickbait shit, using transformation, giving you generic answers for what, what the, this program is for you. You got back pain. You want to lose weight. This is for you. We (laughs) we could do that and we can make a lot of money, but none of us want to make money that Uh, way. You can't really do a before and after picture with back pain. You (laughs) just got to take the person's (laughs) record, really. I I was, I was wondering about this because you were talking about fighting fire with fire, right? Because there are people out there and they're doing exactly that. So at what point do you realize you have to use the same tactics that the shysters are using to try and muscle out them? Well, well so the, so what, here's what we also have noticed uh, is that the, the trends are starting to change a little bit. You're starting to see now because of social media, because remember now all of us are, we're all uh, not kids, right? We all grew up in an era where we didn't have social media and the internet. And we're lucky enough to grow up to where we're not so old that we don't know, understand it, but we weren't, we're not so young that that's all we know. And things are starting to change in the sense that What's starting to be more effective now is what we're really good at, which is transparency. You're starting to see yeah. companies try and be more and more transparent and people become more and more connected to their consumer because consumers are demanding it. So although we're doing things differently now, I think the way we're doing them is the way that they're going to be oh, done. Yeah. Yeah. The, the average consumer is also far smarter than they were before. As dumb as or as ignorant as the average person is when it comes to fitness and health, Trust me, they know, a, they know a lot more now than 20 years ago. When I was in gyms 20 years ago, man, it was like 
the people really were clueless. Now people are starting to question things like like that's that whole debacle that came out where they said, oh, coconut oil is all is unhealthy and blah blah blah. And that, you had a lot of everyday people going, um, actually. I don't think that's correct. <laughs> you guys have actually been selling some bullshit for a long time now and getting people. And these are everyday people. I was getting messages for people who are like, Sal, I think that they're wrong. And I'm like, well, how do you know this? Well, I've read this. Infor- There's a lot more information that's out there that's better. And transparency starting to win. And Tom, I think the Tom battle Billion, is Tom Billu said this really well. You know, he said, we've all been shot. And we're all bleeding out, and just some of us know it, and some of us don't. And you will have to get on board with that. We, the power of social media and digital streaming media right now is anyone could almost peer in. Almost all your celebrities now started off a of YouTube or some social media platform first, and so the ability to peer into someone's life and find out if you're full of shit or not is becoming easier <laughs> and easier. So we would much rather lean on this message, keep our integrity, know we're going to make a little less money right now because we know in the future you'll have to play by you'll have to play by these rules because it'll be too easy to expose people on the bullshit and we're watching it happen. The pendulum's swinging back. We've had the same thing on our podcast too and Chris has always been very open about the process, what he does, what goes on behind the scenes, the struggles. And I've had some people who sort of like traditionally trained in marketing who are like, you're showing weakness, that's going to make people not want it. And that's just not fucking true. Like right. people are like, I know you, I know what you've done, I know how you've learned, how you've grown, like I've really connected with you and your business model. And then that creates, not only does it create a much better connection to the person when you then work with them, they also like, want to work through it with you. It's like you you create so this relationship that makes it, and they're also more likely, so you're going to ask them to do something that maybe they didn't want to do to create trust. You're, you're much more likely to get, and then they're also going to get better results, right? Because they are more invested in the process. They're more invested in you as a coach, the person you're working with. So, I mean, I completely agree with you. It's just, you know, it's, it, it's, it's sort a of, challenge. It's well, that tipping point we, at the here's moment. How we, here's how we do it. Uh, you know, our our we're first off we're lucky in the sense that um you know adam calls us idiots of idiot savants all the time because you know when we first started the podcast we were very raw we would just go we still do it this way we just go we 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 just start talking um a lot of bullshit goes on in the beginning which turns out to be quite entertaining for some people people like that part of our show and luckily that's been part of our the formula of success so we've got the entertainment factor there on accident so that works for us um, and, and again, we, we can take complicated information and kind of communicate it to the average person. So that kind of works for us. Um, and I, again, because we, because of the way technology works nowadays, we didn't need massive corporate sponsors to deliver information. You just don't need that anymore. It's the great, what we're, what we're witnessing right now is the greatest decentralizing of power that we've ever seen in mankind, ever. Music, TV, media. Look at media. Look at news media. The distrust in news media today is greater than it's ever been, and people don't even get their news anymore from these from 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 news networks because of social media and the ability to share information. And the funny part is, people think Donald Trump was the one who started that. Donald Trump was just smart enough to see that and yeah. campaign on it. Yeah, I mean that was just br- when you dissect that, that was just brilliant campaign. That was, and so now you're seeing. So when it, so transparency, if people aren't getting it now, they're going to have to get it later on because the consumer's starting to demand. Like a realism. In fact, when we first started the podcast two and a half years ago, most of the fitness pictures I saw online were, and you still see a lot of them, but there were more before, highly doctor upped, highly, uh, highly mm-hmm. photos- uh, photoshopped pictures. I'm seeing people now who've been around for a little while, who've been on Instagram for a little while, are now posting pictures of themselves. This is what I look like in perfect lighting flex, and this is what I look like relaxed, and this is how real I am, and whatever. And it's like those fuckers, you're trying hard now to get jump on the transparency <laughs> train because they see that the consumer is starting to demand it. So, it part of it's a gamble. That's where we think it's going. Uh, a lot of the signs are showing that it's going in that direction, um, but we think we're right, and we'll find out. So you mentioned something about um, sponsorship, right? And uh, Chris is uh, Chris is the main guy of the No Response Thrive podcast, and there's no sponsors. And I know that you guys. For a long time, you didn't have any sponsors. And one of the most boring things of podcasts is having to skip through the first 10 minutes while the person <laughs> proletizes about their about their sponsors. And I, I mean, I truly hate it. I can't. Yeah. So there's some great information that's coming up, but then you just have to sift through that nonsense first. So how did you guys make that decision to accept a sponsor? So like somebody who's then taking some of your airwaves? Well, there's, ha- there's a couple ways. There's not just like a, a, a single formula. I we think have we- to really like the people yeah, behind the product. 
it, you, you have to like the product yeah. and you have to really like the people. And then they also have to be okay with how we decide to deliver that message too. Because, yeah. uh, and we, we decided early on the exact same thing you just said. We all said like, I hate when I listen to a podcast and the first eight, I mean, I love Joe Rogan, but the first eight minutes <laughs> of his, po- every podcast is he is pretty funny though, isn't he? When he does those ads, yeah. I like, listen to it. He's he, pretty funny. He is. And he does it smart. That's how he gets people to listen. Yeah, exactly. He does a great, so I think fighter and the kid do an incredible job of doing their commercials also where they and do. And we did a little bit of that also. Like we do a little bit of humor and this and that when trying to, trying to make commercials not sound so blah all the time. But it had to be a, a partnership and a relationship that we saw more than just a supplement, just like the person. Had to be something else that we see from. So, like for example, Chimera has been with us for a very long time. Um, we are we talk about supplements on our show a lot, and we talk about them as splitting hairs as far as the d- difference in your overall physique or your goals. Very very small, and we d- we talk that there's much bigger rocks to focus on before you're looking for that. In fact, we give the analogy of it's it's like putting high octane gas in a Pinto, you know, in your drag racing. Like the difference that you're going to get a performance from that high octane gas in that car. Build a better engine first, you know. Build a Ferrari engine, you're going to get down that track a lot faster. So. You know, when it comes to supplements, we got nobody who wanted to connect to us. But Chimera is a coffee company. We all drink coffee. We all love coffee. And all the science that's coming out on nootropics is very fascinating. We dabbled in that a little bit. This was before Chimera. Um, I didn't like any of the synthetic stuff. Same thing for Doug. Doug got headaches. I did, I react. I didn't like it at all. So I was super anti. I'm a fan. Sal loved them. Justin was neutral on them. So we agreed back then that, okay, well, we like nootropics. We like well, everything that's coming out with that, but I'm not a fan of the synthetic stuff. So when Chimera came around and they had a coffee that had the natural nootropics infused in it, it was like, oh, this is cool. And then we're like, well, let's call and let's see what these guys are all about. Met with them, hit it off instantly. Like just really good guys, really good message. And so that's how we made that decision. And almost every single thing that we've done as far as sponsorships has been the same way. Do you guys use uh, nootropics? But I, I know your your background is in... Yeah, so I've, I've tried quite a few things um, just out of interest. And in general, I went through a period where... So I, I tried like a full month of Qualia because that was, that was the one that it was really out there. All the different... They've sort of taken a shotgun approach. We'll just throw everything in there and ho- hope something sticks. And some of the stuff... I think is good and well backed. Some of the stuff, actually, if you look at the the research, suggests it probably won't do anything at all. Um, it has DHEA, so if you're a tested athlete, you can't take it. Um, but anyway, so I tried that for a month. I did some organic acids before and after to look at my neurotransmitters before and after. So I wanted like a metric that oh, I could actually great. measure. And you better explain what organic acids are uh, because okay. most people won't know. Yeah. So it, do those reflect things like dopamine? Serotonin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Turnover, so not the, the actual the, the turnover itself. And there are some tests where they look at you the actual neurotransmitters in your urine. And they're not very well validated at all. But particular, particularly the turnover, the metabolic breakdown products of dopamine and the catecholamines, so norepinephrine, epinephrine, and then serotonin and its breakdown marker, 5 hydroxy acetic acid. And also the other side of that pathway, which is it's sort of like a can be pro inflammatory, it's sort of like a, a metabolic. Um, it's a metabolic pathway that gets you sort of get stuck in if you've got some inflammation going on, quinolinic acid, and you can look at the balance of those things, mm. and that's fairly well validated. So, and there, and there are some other things in an organic acids test. You can look at um, intermediates in the Krebs cycle. You can look at um, markers of overgrowth oh, of certain yeast cool. and bacteria. Um, some some of so this is what we use for a lot of nutrient deficiencies. So. Um, it, if you if you imagine there's a pathway that requires a certain B vitamin, right? And if you don't have enough of that B vitamin, then one particular intermediate builds up. And so you measure that intermediate in the urine, and then you know that you probably need more of that B vitamin. So that gives us a better idea of how, so we're talking about targeted supplements. Mm. Again, we work with a lot of people um, who are on low carbohydrate diets, who want to try a ketogenic diet. We often see raised uh, requirement for something like carnitines because so they need better, they, they need to get that fat into the mitochondria better. But we'd rather measure it in the urine rather than just tell you to take carnitine because oh, we don't know if it's going to work. Well, well you almost could at this point, right? Yeah, We've tested yeah. so many. If you're on a ketogenic diet, you, you should be taking carnitine. carnitine. Yeah, oh, yeah, wow, much. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, 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 you, and you know it works to boost performance. So if you, if you, if you look at, um, the guys talking about IVs in professional sports. So uh, Mo Farah, who's a UK inju- uh, distance runner, multiple time world and Olympic champion, he uses carnitine IV infusions. We, uh, a lot of the, the Tour de France cyclists do it too. And because they're going to rely on a lot of fat metabolism, and they need to make sure that fat's getting into the mitochondria, Makes perfect sense. carnitine, you know, is like magic. So sometimes if somebody's struggling on a ketogenic diet, you tell them to take a few grams of carnitine, like it's like somebody switched the lights on. Mm. Wow. Uh, so, so I did some of this stuff 
uh, quietly before and after, and I've tried some of the other stuff, and it, a lot of it feels very artificial to me. And like, I, it's like I know I'm more focused. I know my brain is working better, maybe, but I also know from just playing the game for a long time that there's no such thing as a biological free lunch. So something that you're asking your brain to do now, which you wouldn't want to do normally, you're going to pay for that later. So if you're not sleeping properly, recovering properly, you know, doing all this other stuff, then I think you're going to see uh, d negative downstream side effects. And, and that's, that's, that's a big part of it too. Did that's you notice a change in your, at, when you did the testing before and after? Did you, what did you see? Well, yeah. tell them what you were doing whilst taking the... Uh, yeah, so, so it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was an interesting time to take it because it was sort of like super high risk, but also super high reward. So <laughs> I, I, I I can't believe you did. I that. like this story already. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I took qualia in the month before my PhD defense, and um, your PhD defense is basically uh, you stand up in front of. So this is the way. That, so I did my PhD in Norway. So I did it in Norway. But I, I have um, three international experts. Like I ended up with like the true, true tops in the field that I did my PhD in, who were basically going to grill me on my PhD for oh, three shit. for for three hours publicly in front of all my friends and family. Damn. So you, you basically spend a month and you go back over all the research that you did. So you're like, so you really remember one of the biggest mistakes you can make is not reading your the rereading your thesis before you get grilled on it. You're like, oh shit, did I write that? Like, oh. <laughs> so so you need to read all of that, but then you also need to read all the research around it and then also the more the more up-to-date research because it had been like six months or something since i submitted my thesis so that the you know it's moved on so yeah, yeah so i did all of this stuff in that month and then also you know like i was sleeping terribly because i was terrified of this thing and then i also had to fly i was in seattle at this point i had to fly to norway and i arrived literally the day before my defense like the night before my defense so like i hadn't slept i was jet lagged and so i was taking quality this whole time and i do think I do think that it helped because I mean I did really well in the defense despite being completely sleep deprived but <laughs> I was I was pretty trashed for like a month or two afterwards and oh, I think wow. I just asked so much of my body including pushing it cognitively for that long period of time um so I think it helped me in the short term but maybe uh, I did pay for it um again uh, later on and I I did notice the thing so when I the first one I, I took it it was like taking MDMA it was it, it felt exactly the same I had that same oh. I had that same, you know, theoretically, if I'd taken MDMA, I think it, um, it it felt very similar. And then I would also have like a come down, like a crash later in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And that kind of left, like towards the end of the month, um, that kind of disappeared. Um, and so then I was, so then I, I feel like I maybe wasn't getting as much out of it. They'll tell you that it changes over time because you're building these things up. And, you know, it's difficult to tell whether that's true or not. So, so there's kind of benefits and downsides, but I've, after playing with most of the ones on the market and trying them out, I've kind of decided I've kind of stopped using them. Actually. I agree. I, I've I've done a lot of uh, personal exper experimentation with the the racetams in particular, paracetam, aniracetam, oxyracetam, and the new pepsi. No pepsi. Yeah. And all of those. And what all what turns me off of the synthetic nootropics is, and what turns me off anything that I take uh, uh, that's synthetic is I notice a tolerance building effect, and then I I notice uh, uh, increased side effects. As I, uh, you know, continue to take it, yep. which tells me that my body's adapting in some way, which usually means there's some kind of negative feedback. And then loop. it's then it's not a true nootropic because if it's a true nootropic, you shouldn't become right. uh, resistant to the effects. You should get the same effect every day, every time you take right. it. Right. The, the, it's it's an acute. It's more of an acute. Uh, and here's the thing: is it really a nootropic, or is are you is it perceived? Are you perceiving that you're better off? Like caffeine, for example, people will say it's a nootropic, but not. It's really not. It's a stimulant. Yeah. But people will perceive that they're smarter or, you know, Ritalin or modafinil, which are more just kind of stimulants, right? So that's why I, I'll mess with them here and there when, I, when I'm going to have some fun or if we're going to go to an event and I'll take a few of them. But I notice this tolerance building and then I get this kind of these uh, side effects that start to build and um, I don't really like them. I also notice a little bit of neuralgia from uh, some of the race attempts, which is, I don't, I haven't completely connected them to that, but I did read some, uh, some I have read other users say the same thing, which you don't want to necessarily fuck with. Yeah. So uh, do you guys, do you guys do this testing for clients? I mean, yeah. So uh, everybody who comes in the door gets one of these. Wow. It's We're going to have to do some stuff together. Oh, you definitely should. We'll, because you know, we'll just so you guys know that. a big reason why we have been so anti someone it's not because there's not, there's research for lots of things that work. You know, and, you just and, you don't know if you're taking what you right. need. Like I just, right. none of, we've never felt comfortable. I'm not going to tell the masses, even something that as as research, and we all we do talk uh, positively about something like creatine, but you might not need it. 
Right. You know, you yeah, know, so like 30% are non-responders is something like that. Right. right. So you know that if you give that general recommendation, most people are going to benefit from it, but you, you know, not necessarily. Or if you probably have some clues with that, right, with the methylation. Yeah, so if you have if you have methylation difficulties, then I'm almost certain that, that creatine is going to be beneficial because All creatine right. is one of the major Creatine production is one of the major things you use methylation pathways for. So if you if you're not doing well in that department, then creatine is just going to offload some of that. So let's system. let's walk through this right now. I know this is something that we probably would normally talk off air, but I love letting our listeners in on the behind the business stuff. How would we work this out? Like, how does it walk me through um, the process of somebody coming? Like, let's say for example, we wanted to say, I say, okay, let's let's take let's agree on some supplements that, especially with your guys' experience, that you tend to recommend a lot. We decide we're going to take them on as a sponsor now because now we actually have a, a resource that can test them and say, these could be potentially good for you. Uh, how does that work? I, I, I call you, I email you, and then I how much do I pay to get a test? Like, how does this all so, work? So I back up and yeah. give them, there was a story from last week that yeah. just totally blew me away. So I did an interview with uh, Rob Wolf on his podcast, and I talked about some of the machine learning experiments that we've been doing with our data. So most people won't know what that term is and, and maybe I won't go into it too deep, but just know that we've been collecting an awful lot of data over the last three or four years from a thousand athletes. And I found a way using an algorithm to predict the results of a blood chemistry or a urinary organic acids test or a stool test or a urinary hormone test using just health assessment qu questionnaire data. So I can get you to answer 51 questions close-ended questions with radio buttons and then I can use that data to predict what we're going to see with dopamine turnover say and so I talked about this on the Rob Wolf podcast last week and somebody heard me on that podcast they talked about they heard me talk about my health journey and they're like holy shit that happened to me what did you do and then he came and did the seven minute analysis which I'll, I'll give you a custom link that you can put in the show notes it's important that I understand where everyone is coming from because my algorithms may not work as well on people who come from a different audience. You have to understand that all of our clients, they came mostly from uh, Rob Wolf and Ben Greenfield, and I don't know. And they know. tend to be endurance athletes. A little they, bit of a self-selection yeah, bias. Exactly, there. so it's, uh, it may, I don't know how important this is. So I'll give you a custom link to put in the, sh in the show notes if people wanna do this analysis. But anyway, this guy did the analysis and he knew his main complaint, I, I know this because he wrote in this like a text area, his main complaint was elevated sex hormone binding globulin and low testosterone. And then my algorithms predicted perfectly low testosterone. And then on the next page, after we finished the analysis, I showed him a whiteboard explainer video on the effects of cortisol and testosterone that Tommy and I put together. And he's like, holy fucking shit, I need to talk to this guy wow. like yesterday. That's awesome. So and, that's and, the process. He can't go on, Tommy. And I was just going to say, so this is based on, so it's 53 questionnaires, uh, 53 questions, but it's like talking about sleep, talking about sex drive, oh, talking yes, about so uh, mood and digestion. And so- Anxiety. And, 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 and we focused on five different things. So um, hemoglobin, uh, sex hormones, uh, gut dysbiosis, uh, circadian rhythm. Um, and what was the fifth one? I can't remember. Anyway, so it's like five broad categories that we know are probably going to be reducing performance in an athlete because that's those are the guys that from, we our work with. From, from our experience. From our experience. These are the things that, for the most part, kill the performance in the athletes that we've been working and with. And then, so everybody who's come in has done this health assessment questionnaire and it allows us to better understand what's going on in them. It's like, you know, you're a, you're a doctor, you take a history, right? So this is part of us taking a history. And then they also did most of these tests. And then if you, if you train the algorithm and you give them the, the initial questions and you give them the test results, then the algorithm can predict what you're going to see on the test results. And most of the people that we work with will still get these tests because there are, you know, we want to nail down certain sure. stuff. I can't, pr I couldn't predict couldn't, everything. You can't so we predict test everything. Exactly. So we're collecting hundreds of biomarkers. Some things are very predictable, other things not so much. So I'll give you an example. The PCR uh, DNA stool testing that we do, it finds a multitude of different parasitic infections. So Giardia, Crypto, Entamoeba histolytica, Cyclospora, so yeast, cyclospora yeast and, and, and C. diff over, there's like so many different things. And when I say machine learning, specifically what that means is I'm training the algorithm by example. I'm actually showing, here's an example of somebody with a Entamoeba histolytica infection. Here's an example of somebody with a Cryptosporidium mm. infection. Well, I don't have that many examples, even though we've worked with a thousand athletes. I think I've only seen Entamoeba histolytica maybe two or three times. That's not enough training data for the for the algorithm. So there's only certain things that we can predict, but still- But with enough still, data, you should be able to. Yeah, so this is the thing. If we were to get together, if I was to start, say, a data co-op, and so you've interviewed Michael Ruscio, maybe we could get together with him. 
Maybe there's some other guy over here that's collected a lot of data. And we put all these datas together into a co-op. Like, maybe we could pretend. That'd be brilliant. Fuck yes. Well, that'd be, <laughs> we that. that'd are be you brilliant kidding me right now? That's like the main reason why we are so anti-supplements is for that exact reason. Because it's just... It's small, but it could be big for somebody. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, oh my god, if you have a if you have a basic deficiency in a nutrient, to that, make, it's like life changing to supplement. Right. That right. Nutrient. That could be a game changer. Now, I, we believe that that's a minority. That most people, if you're eating good, well, whole food, balanced diet, exercising properly, you should be okay. And these little supplements that everyone's pitching as the next best thing to get you leaner or build muscle is a crock of shit. But if you got something where we could test and be very individualized, well, even for, before, even more I mean, than that's that, that's freaking awesome. One of the problems with testing in the in the past is that it requires so much collect, you know, lots of blood, urine, stool. Yeah, it's hard to do. Like if you can, if you can narrow that down to a questionnaire, holy shit, that's like the holy grail, right? Freaking a, that's yeah, cool. it's um, that's like a billion dollar idea. So it, it could be, it, it could disruptive. be. So I'll, 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 you know, we came up with this idea. So we were gonna first, it was gonna be we we're gonna try and predict. Uh, so people don't like doing stool tests. Uh, urine tests are easier. Blood tests. I mean, blood tests are like the gold standard because they've been used for the longest time. We understand them the best. So we were going to try and predict, say, stool and urine from the blood. And then we sort of like move further and further away. So like we have all this questionnaire data. Like, could we, um, could, we did, could we predict that somebody has a lower than optimal hemoglobin level or lower than optimal testosterone level because you know the certain things that say on a questionnaire and like when chris was sending me back the results with like the sensitivity and specificity so the likelihood that a positive result is pos is truly positive and a likely likelihood that a negative result is truly negative like i was like this just can't be true like i, I just I, I don't believe that it's actually that good but it's at sort of it's almost at gold standard levels like 90 so if anybody understands wow, this, that statistics, yeah so 90 plus percent sensitivity and specificity in general like not for everything but for most of the things and you're like if i can if you can just do that from a, a questionnaire and yeah so we'll, we'll maybe fuck me that's money right there hell yes and that so is. maybe we'll say that somebody has a gut dysbiosis but yeah then maybe we need to do some stool testing to truly figure sure. out what the problem is but if we know where to start right, right. already you've mm -hmm. you've reduced the cost and um the access the entry point and because you know some of these tests you know some people like they live in other countries don't have access to them so we're gonna we're, we're you, trying now with people yeah, abroad gonna, just working from the algorithm you've done two things in when you look at uh, economics and market uh two things that are and you've done them both that are huge and usually people will do one or the other which is increase accessibility and increase efficiency and you've done both there right if yeah. that's if that works out the way you're saying it is now you've made it very accessible to people and uh and it's very efficient so it's become less expensive it's pretty exciting i mean okay so now you got me all excited about this right <laughs> uh, now. <laughs> I know, it's just the thing. I, I was just thinking about this when you were talking about nootropics like how can i artificially hack my ability to concentrate well, holy shit, when I first started doing those experiments on my laptop with that algorithm XG Boost and those success rates are coming back, the, the sensitivity and the specificity, I was like, my eyes are popping out of my head. You know, talk about, you know, that's my nootropic is right. <laughs> giving a fuck about what you're working right, on. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ba balancing your body the way it should be. Yeah. So can you tell me like some, uh, what are the, some of the most common ones that you guys tell people? Are people major deficient in iron? Or you see yeah, what do you guys B? see a lot what do, of? What do you see a lot of? It's the, it's, it's the opposite with iron. Talk about iron. Yeah, iron so, iron's so, too much. You see that yeah, too so, high. Yeah, yeah so we, well, well, now that we know that it's all in Captain Crunch, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I get it now. <laughs> This is actually, yeah, so we, we went on the Ben Greenfield podcast and we talked about iron overload and we did like a mini sort of program where people come to us, get a blood test and we sort of look over things. And what we really found was that most, and it tends to be, uh, also master's age athletes, so, you know, maybe 30, 35 plus males, and they almost all have some degree of iron overload. Mm -hmm. And it's something, you know, especially if you're a successful athlete, there's definitely a trend towards, you know, if you, if you, have a tendency towards iron overload you also have a tendency towards high hemoglobin levels and you know higher performance so you kind of like you're self-selecting into that population because you're already somebody who's going to be performing better but in the long term it's potentially going to cause issues so we actually see you guys, often see you guys more, advocate like bloodletting yeah absolutely <laughs> it's true yeah yeah donating yeah, so, blood is one of the best yeah, things yeah, to do yeah, for and we recommend it to loads of people go go to your red cross and donate blood oh, the shit. problem is that both chris and i are brits and in the u.s if you're british or you grew up in the uk you're not allowed to donate blood because they think we all have uh BSE, uh, bovine, you know, uh, mad cow disease. Uh. So I, so my ferritin I know is a little bit high. I'd really love to donate blood, but I can't. You just play, dude. You just, you just yeah. Sit. So I'm, I've got the equipment at work. I you think just I might bleed just do yourself. It myself, <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've gone full Start to look like a vampire in your, your cabinet's <laughs> full of blood. What's I've gone on? full circle. So when I was sick, um, I was in the hospital having iron infused into me because I was absor absorbing it so badly from my food. 
And now I've got to the point like Tommy where my ferritin's starting to creep up and there's no other signs of inflammation. So interpreting the blood chemistry is a little bit tricky, but ferritin generally is the most stable storage form of iron, right? That's your best. Yeah, position. ferritin and transferrin. Between the two, you can have a good idea. So what, yeah. do you, what do you guys see the most? What's the most common you see right now? Amongst Gut your, dysbiosis. Your... So, I mean, if you're an That's athlete- That's so common nowadays. Yeah, so especially the endurance athletes, right? They're really- th- And that, this includes me, by the way. I'm still going out and doing it. And this. That's exactly what I'd be doing right now if I wasn't recording this podcast is I'd be out on my mountain bike, thrashing the hell out of my gut. And what I mean by that is when you exercise, it's normal exercise physiology for the blood to be diverted away from the gut towards the exercising muscles. And think think about it from an evolutionary perspective. This makes perfect sense. You're being chased by a tiger. What's the point in investing in digestion? That's a long-term building project. Let's just get those muscles going, get the fuck out of here. And then, in fact, uh, if you get scared hard enough, you literally shit yourself. Exactly. Or throw up. Yeah, like everything. Just, just get it out ways. because you don't. Yeah, you got. You're not. Got nothing right. to do with it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So what happens is you divert blood away from the gut, and then when you stop. The blood comes rushing back in quite quickly and you can see a reperfusion injury. Maybe you should talk about that, Tom. I feel oh, yeah. a bit weird talking about that. Oh, no, it's, yeah, it's just, so, so, my, um, so the research that I did part of my PhD was in like stroke models. So particularly pediatric newborn babies was actually my, uh, there I did my PhD in. But we know, so anytime you have the blood cut off to um, an organ, say it could be the brain, it could be the heart and a heart attack, um, then when you get a buildup of metabolites, so it's actually, you benefit from this when you do like blood flow restriction training, right? You get a build, an increase in uh, metabolites. And then when, when, you, um, when you remove the cuff, say, you get sort of like a, a, a rush of blood back. And that's kind of sort of part of the adaptation too. Uh, but it causes part of the injury process in a stroke or a heart attack. Or, um, and when you look at particularly long-term endurance exercise, if you're going sort of say, uh, 80 plus of VO2 max or so very intense for a long period of time or just going for a long period of time if you look at uh, ultra endurance uh, marathon races they've done studies and like most of them have blood in their stool afterwards right so you've had this injury to the gut that's so severe that you're actually bleeding into your gut um, and it's on a it's on a small level you have to see it on a stool test but having that continuous you know that long period of time where you're not allowing blood to go to the gut and then the, the blood suddenly comes back and then usually you throw a bunch of crap food down the hatch afterwards yeah. because you need to recover in, in, your, in, in your in your in your wow. in your feeding window and then you're actually probably just um you're just adding insult to injury right, right the, the guts the more. guts not ready and then you're throwing loads of food down so if this is happening continuously then you're you're absolutely in the in the right stage to build up some Holy kind of dysbiosis Holy cow cuz th- now my mind is getting blown because in our industry of muscle building and fat loss, one of the most uh, lucrative uh, aspects of the supplement industry is is taking advantage of the invented post anabolic window. <laughs> the twenty eight nanosecond yeah, anabolic window. Like thirty yeah. minutes after your workout, you have to consume something <laughs> because, of course, that sells their their process. Mind powders, you, we're whatever. training them to at beast mode too. Training and hard. So, so here you got someone busting their ass really, really hard, probably on stimulants, which is already fucking with blood flow anyway because yeah. they're all vasoconstrictive, right? They're diverting blood from the gut. They stop the workout. Blood is going back to the gut, and the, what they're putting in their in their gut is highly processed, artificially flavored garbage. To, no so the, wonder, no wonder you're seeing so many problems. Yeah, and the perfect workout is, and you know, we love to wail on CrossFit. I used to do CrossFit a lot, but it's that kind of when you're crushing yourself, like for like thirty plus Rabdo. minutes or an hour. Yeah, <laughs> in that kind of in that kind of range. Or so we work with a lot of obstacle course racers, and they have like two hour sessions where they're basically like doing burpees and then CrossFit style mm. workouts for like two hours, right? And then you finish that, and the first thing you do is you throw back a large meal of just like all this nonsense or shake or whatever. Like that's the last thing your gut needs at that point wow wow, wow. no and so Fuck, you're that's crazy it's so it's like it's like this perfect storm you're kind of creating you're in this environment where uh you're much more sensitive to things that are probably are not good for you and on top of it you throw things that are not good for yeah. you it does play into what you said earlier about frequency right you're tapping into that frequency thing if you could go less hard maybe shorter but more often mm-hmm that might be an advantage in this situation. Because I don't think, how hard and how long do you think you have to go before this becomes a problem? So I th- it's, I don't think anybody's looked at that directly, but we, you know, if you're going for multiple, so like more than two or three hours, it's a definite, but it's also the blood flow restricts a certain amount once you're above a certain amount of intensity. So mm. once you're at that sort of like, 80 plus 85 percent plus a vo2 max if if you're an endurance athlete that's kind of like what you spend a lot of time looking at and so like if you're really around say your lactate threshold anabolic threshold um sorry uh, anaerobic threshold for really long periods of time that's exactly when it is so it's that very high intensity 
for a long for a long period of time where where you're really going to be getting those problems. Yeah, and that's so, got to be very individual, right? So we yeah, have a yeah. lot of OCR listeners too. So what do you typically recommend then? Do you tell them to wait an hour or two before they actually consume food or what? Yeah, and I, I think that's you know, if you can, you know, wait half an hour, an hour, and then have like a real, a real food meal that's going to be digested more slowly. It's not going to sort of lead to a huge rush of, um, you know, hormones because it gets into the gut, where, you know, because of the processing and all that stuff, then it's going to give you more time for it to move through all the various stages. And I think that that's definitely going to give you the most bang for your buck. The other, I mean, the other problem is we see a lot of people who under eat, right? So they're really worried about calorie intake, and they're doing this stuff. So then you, you do have to balance the two. So you may have to find Find a way to get more calories in the rest of the day and we definitely talk more about eating more food rather than eating less food because that's what Super we see hard to you know. balance all these things and, yeah no so i mean I'm, we, it's not always easy and but one of the one of the benefits of and often we see people go you know low carb um or keto and then try and do crossfit or obstacle course racing and that's just like a recipe for disaster <laughs> yeah, never, seen um, it work. never seen it work but if you do if you get better at having periods of time where you don't need to eat so say you do like uh, some sleep low so you know you deplete glycogen stores and the next morning you just do something light and aerobic and so you you increase your ability to metabolize fat you're also then going to increase your tolerance to longer periods without food right and so then i think one of the benefits that you have of being somebody who's metabolically flexible if you want to call it that or if you want to call it fat adapted or you know whatever your terminology is if you can go longer periods without eating um then you're actually going to give your gut a rest some of the time too and not only that but you increase your sensitivity to some of the things you're eating um which for example like protein is another one like constantly consuming high amounts of protein all the time there's actually some studies that are suggesting that every once in a while re restricting protein and then reintroducing it increases protein synthesis yeah. your body becomes more so are you are you familiar with some of this? yeah yeah and, and i think that's the same i mean you can you can come back to any basic physiological principle uh, is of homeostasis right so you try you're trying to get to a to some kind of balance point and if you constantly stimulate the body turns down the message, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could you can say that about almost everything, right? right? So if you take if you take heroin, you need more and more heroin to get the same effect. If you if you take protein, you know there's certainly a point where if you're continuously stimulating that, it's just going to say, okay, well this stimulus is coming all the time. I'm just going to turn down the message slightly because I don't want to be constantly forced to do something that I want to do. So there's there's always going to be this balance of. So if you're talking about protein, you could also talk about carbohydrate. You know, feast and fast, right? You want to give the stimulus occasionally, but also you need to take it away to get the best benefit from it. Wow, fascinating. Now, uh, what what do you what do you think about in terms of to prevent gut dysbiosis in athletes? Uh, comparing things like a you know ketogenic diet versus because I know for long distance endurance, uh, ketogenic dieting seems to be okay for a lot of them, right? Yeah. What do you what do you what's better for or is it entirely individual? I mean, my experience is it can be very very individual. Yeah, I think it's going to be it is going to be really individual. And so you, you're always going to come back to it depends. And you know, if you try it and you feel like shit, then you're probably not doing the right thing. That's um, tricky though, because you yeah. might feel like shit in the beginning. In, in the then... short term. And there's definitely some studies. <laughs> so my my background when I first got into some of this more kind of um, holistic type health approaches, uh, health engineering, we like to call it, um, rather than medicine, it was through multiple sclerosis and so multiple sclerosis research. And uh, my stepbrother has multiple sclerosis and we kind of tried to deconstruct the disease to figure out all the c kind of things that could be happening. And in some of the MS research, they've kind of shown that in the short term, if you go on a ketogenic diet, um, the diversity in certain, you know, so diversity isn't always good, but, you know, in general, it tends to be better. Um, but, the you know, some of the beneficial species, the ones that we think are almost certainly beneficial, they tend to decrease in the short term, but then they increase again in the long term. Mm -hmm. So, you know what you know it, sort of early on maybe you don't feel so good maybe you're not getting quite the same performance but in the long term you might see a benefit and it's kind of like i always use the analogy of uh, heart surgery right so if you look at heart surgery in the middle of it it looks like a murder but if you went, <laughs> if, you went if you went to the end actually you sewn the guy up and he walks out the door so so some things will take some adaptation um but you know in terms of in terms of preventing that kind of dysbiosis, we know, so if you, so treating what you use to treat and what you use to prevent are going to be slightly different, right? So we know that if you're reducing symptoms, you know, something like uh, a low FODMAP diet could be really beneficial. You know, you could even go as far as a, an elemental type diet. I don't know, uh, uh, Michael Ruscio talked a little bit about this stuff on your show too. Um, but, you know, one of the big problems is going to be that food processing. So the food is coming into the gut in a state that the body isn't used to, and then you're going to drive a certain bacterial population in a part of the gut where you don't want it. So that's that's a big part of the problem too. So if you're just eating 
actual real food that's going to be that's going to be really beneficial to start with and that's going to prevent you causing those problems down the line um and then also just that not like you said that continual stimulus like you get, come straight off you come straight off the track or straight off the training session and you just suddenly throw a bunch of food down the hatch um you know i think you know if you can wait a bit then you're going to you're and gonna give that it, cut, if in the bodybuilding world it's normally a protein shake or a bar you know yeah. some processed bar or processed shake that i don't know how many times that's flavor of sucralose right i don't know how many times i've seen uh the especially at the the competitive level guys they carry their their drinks and shakes and they literally go to the bathroom they don't even wait till they drink. they're trying to catch that anabolic window so quick <laughs> that they go to the restroom when they're done with and so they still have this and then they're thinking oh i got this big pump i've got to get the nutrients in there right away and they shuttle this you know liquid sugar drink down or shove this bar it's- yeah, and you've got because it's so because of the way it's processed you've got these um You've got the the macronutrients or you know the building blocks. So you've got like glucose or you've got amino acids in a part of the gut where they shouldn't be because they take time to be digested and then absorbed through the gut. But if they're ending up somewhere where they, and they, they sell that normally, by the way, they yeah, sell yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So if you faster take, digesting, yeah. If you take Vitago, then it runs straight <laughs> through your gut and then it's going to be you know you're going to get that glucose spike even even faster. You're like, well, hang on a second, is that actually a good idea? No, <laughs> it's probably not. That's Holy cr- shit, you're blowing my mind right now. That's crazy. Well, it's the more I learn about this stuff, the more I realize why I have so many gut problems. Is there was years of me and I you doing know, all these things. Did it too? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've both done it, and that's just yeah, it's I, part of what you 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 become this broken athlete because you you train the way you're told to train, and you eat and you the way eat you're told of, to you eat. eat more of the same food yeah. that was causing you trouble in the first place. Yeah, I think everything that happened to me was entirely preventable. If I'd just not eaten wheat in particular and probably dairy too, then I would have been fine. It's not necessarily the amount of exercise I was doing because I was doing twenty hours a week of exercise, which is 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 too much. Isn't oh wow. Well. Yeah, what what I found that worked for me is I had to do an elimination. I did a food intolerance test, which isn't 100% accurate, but it's a great starting point. Mm. I did food intolerance test, elimination diet, um, and I had to avoid, completely avoid. And what I mean by avoid is like it couldn't even, I couldn't even have a single breadcrumb on my food. I had to avoid gluten. (laughs) I had to avoid uh, egg whites. I had to avoid uh, peanuts and dairy. Um, I had, and then I used uh, probiotics, um, and I had, there were certain kinds of probiotics that seemed to help. And I also used, uh, this is when I started using medicinal cannabis. Uh, cannabis also had a, a profound effect on my gut health. So is that as like a, a THC CBD mixture or just like the, the plant itself? Uh, so so um, I had never gotten, I had never really gotten the results I, I, I later on gotten from cannabis until I went down to Belize with a friend of mine on vacation. And I'm down there and I had made the decision that I'm like, you know what, I'm on vacation. Like I've been dealing with these gut problems. I'm just going to fucking enjoy myself. I'm going to eat whatever I want. We also had bought a bunch of shit dirt weed off of the cab driver. And when I say dirt weed, it's like, like when you, you know this, if you, you smoke weed, it's like a bag of like, looks like, you know, crappy like weed. Hay. <laughs> and you got to smoke like two joints to feel like you're getting anything. So I'm smoking the hell out of it with this guy because we have so much of it and it's cheap. And I'm eating whatever I want. And my gut is like, fine. There's not a problem at all. So I get back to the States and I'm not doing that anymore because I'd never really used cannabis before. Uh, I'd use it occasionally, but it wasn't a thing. I got back to the States, and within two weeks, my gut problems came back in a hurry. And I started thinking, like, is it because I was relaxed on vacation? Is it because of this? Like, what was it? And then I read some articles on cannabinoids and their effect on uh, the gut and on the immune system and how they have immunomodulating effects. And so I tried cannabis again. However, the cannabis that you find normally, especially here in California, which is like the mecca of, uh, of marijuana, um, the cannabis that I found was this super high THC strain. And no CBD. And it didn't really do it for me. Um, and so I did more research and I found that really what I needed was a predominantly D- CBD strain with a little bit of THC. A little bit of THC has got benefit too. But I need to have a be able to have a high uh, cannabinoid load. And I can't do that with THC because the psychoactive effects just get unbearable for me. I don't like getting super blazed, uh, at least not uh, on a regular basis. <laughs> not on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, so, Occasionally. Right. Actually, so we're, we're sober on this one, actually. So, But I found, uh, uh, but I, so I started using high CBD cannabis along with, you know, eating a certain way, using probiotics, and man, it was like a godsend. And now I use ca- ca- cannabis, uh, not super regularly, but on a medicinal basis because I do find that um, it makes a big difference when it comes to my gut inflammation. So now I use it more 
uh, you know, as a like uh, after I notice a little bit of a you know gut inflammation, or whatever, I'll start to use it. Whereas before, during that whole heyday, I had to use it um, pretty. It was like every single night I had to use it. So uh, in the endurance world, I know athletes are starting to use cannabinoids now as a, as performance enhancing substances, which I found absolutely I find absolutely fascinating. Are you guys running into that at all? Working with we don't get no, we don't no. get a lot of that actually. Um, so sometimes we've talked about it with people because of. Yeah, so it often comes back to the gut. So it can, you know, um, both animal models and some human studies suggest that if you get the right ratio of CBD and THC and you need the THC THC because the CBD sort of potentiates, they sort of potentiate each other's effects, it can definitely, you know, Im improve like gut inflammation and things like that. So, you know, we, we see it occasionally, but it's not something that we come up very regularly. Um, but I did want to go back. You, you mentioned that, you know, the food sensitivity st food sensitivity testing and the elimination diet. And we very regularly use the elimination diet. Now, it's something that, you know, almost everybody gets on some version of that, depending on where they are. And we don't actually do food sensitivity testing because it's really expensive. And the elimination diet, if you look at, even you could go to traditional, traditional medicine, traditional rheumatology, and they'll tell you that to figure out what food intolerances or allergies you have, the elimination diet is the gold standard. Yeah, still, but, period. And it, yeah, and so that's, but the, you know, it's time consuming, but what it also, does is it makes you be mindful about how the food affects you right. so you remove food and then when you add it back in you have to think oh hang on a second how do i feel after i eat this oh i feel like shit so i shouldn't eat that anymore. teaches you so much more and so yeah the process of being mindful and, and this is something that chris talks, talks yeah, about so a lot. It, was my, it was my wife so she, my wife had done spent like quite a lot of time in the in the lab studying dairy allergies and she was like yeah, no, you don't need to do a food sensitivity test. This is bullshit. And in, and in fact, if anyone listening, if you want to PayPal me four hundred dollars, I will. I <laughs> I'll will use my algorithm. You. No, I won't, even, I won't even use an algorithm. I'll just send you the list of foods. Because what it's going to be is, is you're going to be sensitive if you if your gut is messed up and inflamed. You'll be sensitive to what you're going to be sensitive to what you're ever you're eating a lot. Whatever. Exactly. You, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then there's there's definitely some some regular offenders. So gluten, dairy, nuts, seeds nightshades and by the way if you just started eating a paleo diet you may still be eating some of these things right so what i did was i eliminated wheat and dairy but then i started eating tons of nuts and eggs and seeds and my wife is like looking at my diet going um you just kind of got out of the frying pan and into the fire like why don't you just try eating this and it's like oh, okay yeah and that worked really really well well i love what you said about the elimination and then and going through that process so you can start to connect those dots because we yeah, talk yeah. a lot about people this. don't think they don't even they don't you know what's amazing to me and and I know this from my own experience, like growing up in, as a teenager, you know, some days you have really gnarly shits. Some <laughs> days your gut feels all bubbly. Some days you have random headaches. Some days you don't sleep very well. You don't connect it. But you don't connect to it. no, it anything. No, it's just you think no. that there's like this this fairy that always just gives you a headache or a bad shit every <laughs> once in a while instead of actually starting to analyze what you're consuming and so when you do an elimination diet, this is why I highly recommend it to people too, especially if you're somebody who's battling a lot of issues and you can't get you can't quite figure it out. And you're right, it does take a little bit of a process. It is a little bit of discipline, it is a little bit of work, but it is one of the best things that someone can do to start to make those connections. And it's funny, once you start to realize that Every time you have that pizza, you shit your brains out, you sleep like crap, and you got a headache the next day. It's amazing how much easier it is to skip out on it. Uh -huh. It's not as hard versus when you look at it like, oh, this pizza is going to make me fat. No, don't look at it like that. Mm -hmm. Don't look at it like this food is going to make me fat. How does that food nourish your body? And how does your body respond to it once it gets converted in there? Mm -hmm. Think of it like that. And when you start to learn to do that, it, dieting becomes, it's no longer dieting anymore. It's learning to start to feed the body how with what it wants and what it needs and how you respond to that. And I think... Uh, weight loss, muscle building, all these things become so much easier when you start to connect those dots. So that's mm -hmm. such a great point. Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, it's been great. Yeah, man, what a this fun time. This has been with fucking you. awesome. Fun yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, you yeah. guys are so close. We should do this again, yeah? Yeah, definitely. This yeah. Would be great. Uh, check this out. Go to YouTube, subscribe to Mind Pump TV. We post a new video every single day. Also, you can find us on Instagram, at Mind Pump Media. Uh, my personal page is Mind Pump Sal. Adam is Mind Pump Adam. Justin, who was not here today, is Mind Pump Justin, and Doug is Mind Pump Doug. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. 
Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>